Take a derivative deal. Greetings and felicitations. Hello, I'm Antiderivative Jill, and this is Indefinite Lunch in Infinite Combinations number 101, where I'm continuing a special journey through all of the episodes of Star Trek, the original series. And we're watching in production order. We are on Requiem for Methuselah. We're on which is the uh, 76th episode, meaning we only have four more episodes to go, including this one. 76, 78, 79, yes, that's correct. This is the episode in which Spock nerds out all over the place and Kirk falls in love for seemingly no reason. But some people have some explanations on that. So if you enjoy Star Trek and science fiction in general and are new to the channel, please subscribe because I'm close to 100, 700 and I'm really excited about that. Otherwise, please like and share if you, you know, you want to think more about Spock playing the piano. Before we get into the episode, I want to say hello to the wonderful panel that I have with me today. Hello to Scotty R37. How hey, are hey, you hey. Doing today? <laughs> I am doing really well. I'm anticipating... Like this is a this is a great uh, episode to talk about simply because it's sort of underused or overlooked. I, I'm looking forward to this conversation. You're not wrong about that. I barely had any memories about this episode. And Jim, uh, Jim and Jim, of course, you will see titled here is Captain Duke Shepard. How are you doing today? Good afternoon, Captain Duke Shepard here. We're doing pretty good. And thank you okay. for the invite. Well. Well, thanks for joining us. And also, pop you're culture welcome. curator, I'm so happy you're here today. And oh, my yeah. pleasure. Thank you for having me on here. I'm so happy to be here. I'm going to be really mm -hmm. heartbroken when we're done with the series. Oh, I know. Right. Well, I can't wait to hear your notes about this particular episode. And okay, I will be here for the entire notes. thing. Uh, opinion about this episode i can't wait to hear from hello to stone racket what's going on i am not brahms <laughs> as uh right. <laughs> <laughs> my dog oh, my. <laughs> and uh harpo is deciding whether or not to jump in my lap he's beside me here Yes, well, we're... he's hearing those dogs. Maybe he's yeah, a little oh, yeah. because of that. <laughs> well, well, if he had a headset, he'd 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 be hearing okay. them. But uh, yeah, this episode, uh, Requiem for Methuselah, or as I like to call it, Jerome Bixby does not know his Bible. <laughs> oh. Well, I don't know. It, it, that's the thing I'm questioning. The Cushman book wasn't very explanatory on it, but Jerome Bixby wrote some of the best episodes of Star Trek. He wrote he wrote some really great stuff. And so I don't understand what happened to this one in particular if somebody else made some of the character assassinations in this episode besides Jerome because he wrote Mirror Mirror for for Yeah. And that was I neat. just I think that uh it's just uh there's only so much you can do in a 1 hour episode and this one was just overloaded because we just have to accept uh you know things happening uh quickly <laughs> let's just put it that way right uh, yes but of course uh, i i, I yeah, uh, it's a random romance out of nowhere but uh, well yes the, the, just one thing you know it's louise sorrel just one. and uh when i see louise sorrel i say be still my beating heart <laughs> oh yes she's gorgeous but she like, is DJ just she's nice, exquisite that's, 
Yeah. Like DJ Play Nice says in the chat, today is also a very special day. It was amazing on Friday. We had a show on William Shatner's birthday. Yeah. And today on Tuesday, March um, 26th, is Leonard Nimoy's birthday. And yeah. so he would he would be 93 wow. if he were with us today. And so... So happy birthday to Leonard. Yes, happy birthday yep. to Leonard. And we will remember his legendary work on this show. And I think he's one of the characters in this episode that really elevates the whole experience. Uh, indeed. Yes, very much so. Uh, mm -hmm. Everyone's performances are, are really good. I like the two guest stars. Very good. But there's just so certain things we have to kind of let slide by because... It's just one hour episode. You know, if it was a you know two hour, <laughs> then you maybe think this we... whole thing could be a movie? Wait a minute, it was a movie. <laughs> <laughs> but I will make references to "These Are the Voyages" by Mark Cushman, and also from Star Trek Three Sixty Five by Paul M. Block, which of course I learned about from Raquel Briggs, who reviews all of real Star Trek from sixty six to two thousand five with the Clabbering Times channel on Saturday night at 9 p.m. They're, they're finishing season five of Star Trek Voyager. Seems like they're getting through all of Star Trek so very fast. And, oh man. So they're, they're finishing season five and that's gonna be great. So even, even though I go through my slides in order, you can completely go in any direction you like with this review. And to help with that, I'll read the preview for Requiem for Methuselah. And so I'll read that now. As an outbreak of deadly Rigelian fever spreads through the Enterprise, Kirk, Spock, and McCoy beam down to the planet Holberg 917G in search of Rytalian. Ritalin. Rytalin. Rytalin. It's funny. <laughs> The disease, <laughs> the disease is only known cure. It would explain a lot if somebody was on something. Holberg <laughs> has yeah. only two occupants, a reclusive man named Flint and Raina, his beautiful young ward. Sigh. Flint, is, op <laughs> Flint is openly hostile, but he agrees to provide Kirk with the Vitalin after Raina expresses the interest and interest in meeting the landing party. As the right talent is being processed, Spock is surprised by Flint's astounding art collection, which contains original pieces by Leonardo da Vinci. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, Kirk takes an interest in Raina, but the landing party begins to suspect that Flint is delaying delivery of the precious drug and that his hospitality disguises an ulterior motive and yeah it does yes indeed exactly what it does that yeah, is it's a... like a, like they should have named this episode our man flint or in, <laughs> in in like flint or oh wait a minute those have already been taken how about old yeah. man flint <laughs> Jeez. old man flint <laughs> well Requiem for Methuselah first aired on February 14th, 1969. So this is Ooh. a Valentine's Day episode. Valentine's Day, yeah. Lovey Dovey. Mm -hmm. That explains it. Yeah, Lovey Dovey at warp mm -hmm. speed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that that explains it all for Jim. He forgives yeah, that's, it. Yeah, that's... <laughs> There's love in the air. Yeah, yeah. it's unavoidable. Yep. Yes, well, of course, Louise Sorel, you know. She, now she's a she's a, a brunette in real life, but uh, she looks really good as a blonde as well. Yep, <laughs> and that was her idea too to have a blonde wig. Uh, she wanted to try out being a blonde for this particular role. Yeah, this episode was written by Jerome Bixby, who also wrote Mirror Mirror by any other name, and Day of the Dove. And I think those are all really great episodes. So. So somebody did something to this script. I'm going to, I want to blame Arthur Singer or something. I don't know what happened. It was directed by Murray Golden. And this was his only episode of Star Trek that he directed. He, that was it. He also, but he worked as a producer on the Twilight Zone. 
and did some other stuff. He was a director of other of other shows, like including Batman. So the first captain's log talks about the raging epidemic, and you think the whole episode's going to be about the whole Enterprise crew being sick. And in fact, in the very first teleplay draft, Sulu is supposed to pass out on the bridge so we can see just how serious yeah. this illness is because you're supposed to die within one day of contracting right. this illness. It's supposed to be really frightening. But even though the crew talks about it, oh, we have four hours, we have two hours, we have one hour. They talk about it, but they're just so straight about it. You don't really feel the, emo the, the drama of how hor horrific this kind of thing is. Three crew members have already died. And it just, when when something like that happens off camera to Captain Pike, he agonizes about it. And we don't, we don't feel that in this episode. So Kirk was off character in more ways than one. Yeah, he should have, uh, no. Wow. Does he, does he say anything to Flint? Or is it just McCoy that talks about it in front of Flint? Uh, I'm trying to remember. Well, <laughs> I just watched it I early, don't think early this morning, but I, I don't three think. Three crewmen have yeah. died. Yeah, he should have said nothing. something to Flint. You know, three of my crew have already died. And he gotta, did. I oh, he did? I thought he did? I thought he did when he introduced himself on a planet surface. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I or could it was, be wrong. Or, or, it was, or it was McCoy. But... Uh, Anyway, uh, McCoy can, told him what was going on with the ship. Yeah, he, oh, compared, was dying. he compared it to bubonic, bubonic plague. And of course, yes. then that Flint has a flashback to. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, I would like to the difference between Pike and Kirk in this particular situation is that Pike's angst was based on ordering those men to their death as opposed to just having an illness happening. Yeah. I, I just mean the severity of death. Kirk has agonized over the death of his crew crewman before, and he doesn't really, it doesn't really seem to be all that intense in this instance. He does, he does order a phaser and barrage from orbit. He, he he does, he does. So, yeah, so it's not he, like he, he's he, taking this lightly. That's true. He is willing to, he's willing to destroy them in order to do that. So that is a fair point. And so, actually, I don't, I don't. All of those elements are in the script. I just mean that the drama of it doesn't feel, you don't feel it, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, poor, poor well, execution. And, yeah. Well, and I think that you guys have actually, I, I, I think that one of the, the conversation points that we'll, we'll bump into a couple of times is just how quickly things happen. For this to happen in four hours is, yes, that's an accelerated timeline, an arbitrary uh, finish to this is the urgency level. But yeah, if it had said we have 12 hours to do this, it makes more sense. Exactly. I, that's what I would have done. I would have given them more time because it's just, it's like <clears throat> how many times do we have to have the ticking clock thing on top of the drama that we're witnessing? You know, it's well, like... yes. <laughs> agreed. Hey, chat. Yeah. Well, you're skipping straight to locking the phasers on the coordinates to you said I could jump all around. of the, yeah, I did say you could jump around, but now <laughs> I have to jump around in my notes as a result. And so, well, yeah, so that's, Scotty. that is a good point. That is a good point. <laughs> and I do have that here in my notes about that. And that is a, that is a, like Clint says, that's a interesting test of power, but they say it like they're having tea. Instead of like, oh, <laughs> I'm I, I'm about to obliterate you. You better not. You better. I don't know. It's it's just the delivery. I do like that Captain Kirk does that though. That is that is good. Yeah, uh, Harpo is fine with everything. He's purring away here. So there you go. Meow. <laughs> and Frankel Walker, thank you so much. He reminded me to put in the poll earlier. And he also yeah. says, please subscribe, share, hit the like, and select the live chat. Yeah, Franco he, gets here early. He so early. <laughs> he gets everything done really early. Franco gets yeah. this episode a B minus. Kirk wouldn't act like that. And I do shouldn't. I do tend to agree. Yeah, shouldn't, shouldn't act like act that. Like yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, Scotty and I had a had a bit of a, a pre-argument about that. Oh no. 
<laughs> Hello to everybody in the chat. Good to see you all. Yeah, it is. Hello to Gorilla's Random Thoughts. He says, hey, I'll be able to harass you a lot today since I don't work. Nice. Oh, that is great. I think he should. Good he, he should have put that. I don't have to work. <laughs> and hello to DJ Play Nice. Great to see you playing nice today. Hello, DJ. I'm racing you to 700. Oh, yeah, Gorilla, we're oh. in a race <laughs> together. Let's, 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 let's see who gets it. Well, for a while, you were way ahead of me and I caught up. So let's see. So every time I catch up to you, you jump ahead. So let's see if that happens this time, too. Oh, my goodness. Up. Did somebody do something? How do you mean? Oh, my goodness. Aegis Flow just became a sponsor. Ginger Menace became a sponsor. Fantastic. Pop Culture Curator. Let's go. Gavin Blackburn. Apparently LDG is here. Did somebody? How did I do LDG. That? I don't know how you did that. Keep You're going. already a sponsor. So that doesn't Keep make going. sense. Okay. <laughs> oh, I'm trying to find. It's also in maybe end of the month. And so sometimes these just uh, <laughs> the automatic renewals happen. Oh, that uh, could be what it is. Okay. That, well, thank yeah, you. Thank you. That makes thank sense. you to everyone for continuing to be a member. That means Princess a lot Fiona. to me. Also, yeah. thank you very much, Matt G, for renewing your membership as well as Star. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I know that time guy. The month again. <laughs> it's Nimoy's birthday. Yes, it is, DJ. Yep. Well, I guess Stream Elements is being silly and telling me every time everybody yes, renews their membership. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, or else good. don't. <laughs> it's fine. I, I can live with it. James Caserta says, Taylor Swift looks like a blow. <laughs> Wait a minute. I'm not going to finish <laughs> that. Uh, <laughs> naughty James Caserta. <laughs> James. It's good to see you, James. <laughs> you almost had me with that one. Come on, look at the episode. You could get a, a love robot. It's the 21st well, century. Yeah. Why I mean, is I, the Autobot in chat saying a bunch of people just became sponsors? A lot a lot of people who are regular chat members. Yes, that's uh, crazy stream elements, I guess. I don't know. I don't know, but it was it sure was exciting, Matt G. Uh, <laughs> now, speaking of uh, and oh, go ahead. Sci-fi sit Dan. Hello. Hey, hey. And hello to Canadian Spider-Man. Everybody get their shots. Yeah, hmm. for the right Jillian fever. Yes. Oh, right. Okay. The right talon is the antidote. We need it. <laughs> don't forget to drink your oval team. Right, Jillian. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Should I? I don't know. I'm not gonna take it personally. That sounds like my name. Right, Jillian Fever. Hello huh? to Brogu. Hey Brogu. Hello, everyone. Hope you're having a wonderful day. Kapa. Kapla. Oh hey, there you go. Now we need Bird of Prey five. Is he? Is he yeah. about? Oh, he might show and, oh, Euler Greg agrees with me about this episode. And, well, well this is yeah, the beauty they, of review. It is, and this is one of those episodes that I I still say LBG. season three really inspires TNG because what is this an episode of? It's got two stories. It's got an A story and a B story. The A story being the fever, uh, the effects of which we don't see much of, and the B story is, is I've a got a fever and I need and right talent. See, that's interesting. I'll hold that thought. I do want to address your dual dual stories, your A's and B's. There are they exist. No, I know, but I thought I thought of two different ones. Oh, from uh, next there generation. Could be, well, yeah. Oh man, I wonder if you're going to mention the one I'm thinking of. I wonder. Well, okay, well, I guess I guess you're just gonna have to find out, or I'm gonna have to find out. Now I'm excited. What's happening? The reluctant dragon says, "Let me see the test data first. Hmm. Oh, yep. right. For the before you take a shot for the Rachelian fever. It's, never mind. You're about to die in like 24 hours. Yeah, <laughs> you got to make sure. Have some Ritalin. Yeah. He, right, it, that's really good though the reluctant dragon wants to see the scientific data you can't really get too much in a day though so does jim's dog yeah every, every time he speaks i don't know what's going on here i got the headset on <laughs> gorilla yeah. with the with the just carrot oh, oh my, my god yeah. 
Girl, <laughs> girl at some point was a cuck in this episode and then became a jealous cuck. <laughs> oh my god. Damn. Yeah, that is that is extreme, girl. Bro Goose says, I got a fever and the only prescription that I need more that I need more, cowbell. more cowbell. cowbell. I Don't need you a, think a right talent. Need cowbell. More cowbell. <laughs> Don't you think Dr. McCoy tries cowbell every time there's an out outbreak? Mm. I first things it. first. Try the cowbell. Well, this planet is the the closest place that they have to get this this uh quantity of right talon. So so I'm so they I'm beam sure. down they I'm beam down four they beam down four miles away from where they should be. Why don't they beam down where they should be? Is the first thing that I noticed. Oh, is that what it says? They're four miles? They say was it miles? Well, there are screens that are obscuring Flint's castle. And so maybe they would have, and again, like Spock doesn't discover the uh, human life sign until they get onto the surface. So maybe mm -hmm. it had been a diffusion of the ship's sensors, which is what that Flint is be. looking for. Reflecting. And, uh, no reason, no reason to get down on the planet if there's nothing there. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. the right Allen was there. So Flint's out of luck. Oh yeah, that's right. Because there's some Flint's got that screening yeah. that blocks or, works for the me. Ability to see. <laughs> works for that you. Works is. for me. It works for everybody. <laughs> it's better for you. Actually, yeah. <laughs> it's better for me. It's better for them. Better everyone. Actually, I'm trying to see why I thought what I thought. Maybe I was wrong. Oh well. Works for me then. And so. Well, that's been a thing, actually. That's been a running theme, is that the tricorder doesn't pick up readings where there are readings. But this is one of the episodes that actually says, here's why the tricorder didn't pick up the readings. And so I do appreciate that that was explained. Where other season three episodes just say, oh, the tricorder was on the fritz, I guess. Now, do I detect a little bit of Nomad in this? Mm -hmm. uh, on the M4 bottom. I believe so. Yeah, on the bottom. And on we, the top, I think. We, 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 yeah, we even have the ticking. Mm -hmm. And then it makes a sound of a Klingon disruptor when it fires mm -hmm. its beam. And it's like, wait a minute. Yeah, different sound effects. Come on. No, I do. Oh. It sounds like a disruptor. Yeah. Okay, it says, oh, I'm not Miles. I'm, why, why am I thinking that I'm in I, the metric system? It says four kilometers away. Oh, that's so, much shorter. So, so they should have beamed where the actual right telling was, rather than where they did. Like, why do they want to walk all that way? Is what I meant. Yeah, very strange. Exercise, exercise. But I'll exercise. I'll go with the yeah, I'll okay. go with the I don't know the screens. It's all the screens' fault. Yeah, the screens. The Flint the screen screens. Up. <laughs> the Flint Flint electric. screens. Stay it's out those like Flint. Flint. Those da, da, no, sorry. <laughs> I please forgive me for that interlude. Damn it. Oh, well, you're fine. Well, that's okay. Yes, this is this <laughs> I'm, is I'm fired. Did somebody say <laughs> no? You're fine. No, you're fine. Been, oh, okay. Said, Damn it. <laughs> Damn Mark. it, man. This is made of he is made of parts of Nomad. Mm -hmm. Isn't quite as charismatic as Nomad. The, the old man arrives. And oh yeah, so here we go. Disassemble, disassemble. Isn't it? <laughs> isn't it nice to have a robot without a voice? Just a just a like a robot. Just a robot doing robot things. I'll be yeah, and not a trying robot. to be not trying <laughs> not robot. trying to be like us. Do it's, not kill I. I mean sorry, yeah. do not kill. Do not kill. No, kill I. <laughs> Flint from off screen. And then we have a dolly shot. <laughs> yes. With the robot you know, on the dolly. <laughs> wouldn't he have made a really great Vulcan? Yes, he yeah. would. But but instead he's he's Flint. He's the great uh, James... character actor. Yes. Yeah, James Daly. He's got mm -hmm. that look that he would make a terrific Vulcan. He just got that yes. look. I, it yes. just was screaming at me the entire time. Mm -hmm. Just change your eyebrows a little bit. That's all he needs. Well, what do you what do you know about him? Not much. Uh, 
<laughs> well, well, he you... was in uh, he was in medical center with uh, with Chad Everett. He was uh, was kind of like Doctor Kildare with an older doctor mentor, and and James Daly was the mentor to Doctor Gannon or Chad Everett's character. But I remember seeing him. This is in the eighties. They rebroadcast uh, "Give Us Barabbas." where uh, James Daly portrayed uh, Barabbas. And of course, let's stop at Willoughby uh, with Twilight Zone. Thanks for showing that, Jill. Classic, yeah, this... absolute classic episode. And James Daly is superb in this as well. Yes. Well, yeah, I was watching it this morning. Oh, excellent. Excellent. That's and I just found twist. out that he was... Sorry, Jill. What did you just out... find out? I just found out that he was in Planet of the Apes. Oh yeah, yeah. Was he? Wow. Yeah, Which he's is... in the original. Yeah, he's yeah. one of the three uh, uh, in the court. He's one of the three uh, orangutans. So that's <laughs> that's a, that's an iconic sci-fi career. Maybe, and again, as you mentioned, character actor, and also yeah. uh, father to Tyne Daly from uh, Cagney and Lacey. Uh huh. And, and Tim uh, Daly. Tim Daly, the voice of Superman. In Superman the Animated Series. Also, wasn't wasn't Tim Daly in Wings? Uh, yeah, sitcom? but I, I had a choice, man. I oh, yeah. Superman or Wings. There you go. <laughs> That's fine, Scotty. I understand. Thank you, sir. He got his wings. <laughs> he did. <laughs> oh, Captain. <laughs> there you go again, Captain Joe. Captain uh, Joe. He had, had originally wanted Carol O'Connor for this role. Oh, oh yeah. Bad, bad, bad. Yeah, when I read that, I went, no! <laughs> no, okay, so they no. made the right choice. Yeah, no. James Daly is so much better. Would be, you know, can you imagine Carol O'Connor in this role? It's like, no. no. <laughs> I don't know. I, I would say that I read this chapter. Carol O'Connor was very flexible, so yeah. I don't know. I wouldn't underestimate him. I agree with Pop. Yeah, well, James Daly strikes me as more of a renaissance man than Carol O'Connor, that's all. Well, he was a very prolific uh, stage actor, James Daly. Uh, I don't know much about Carol O'Connor in terms of uh, outside of uh, All in the Family, except no. for when he did the television show uh, adaptation of uh, In the Heat of the Night. So it, it, was, I, uh... I do I do believe in, in Carol O'Connor's range, but I do yeah. appreciate the theatrical background of James Daly. He was uh, in uh, Cleopatra. He's one of the assassins of oh, Caesar. Oh, that's that's where I've seen him at that one. Yeah, oh, yeah. I've never yeah. seen Cleopatra. that's the I've that's the first that. time I saw him. And then uh, he's oh, uh, plays Miles. He plays Miles Donovan in the made-for-television supernatural thriller *Fear No Evil* from 1969. That's cool. Broku says his expression on his face looks like he just caught got caught doing something and. <laughs> uh i disagree he looks like he's not he's kind of ticked or he's annoyed that he has these unwanted guests he's yes that's happy. right and the reluctant, well, the reluctant dragon says james daly is in two episodes of the invaders that's right mm -hmm. he is now, and the invaders now, is something that i want to see yeah now Re reluctant soon. dragon was james daly part of the group the believers in the second season i think that's Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think he's part of the group of the believers. Uh, James Caserta says, if we didn't have a pictorial history of Brahms, it would be okay. Oh, yeah, right. Uh -huh. he, this guy's supposed to be Brahms, but forget about that. <laughs> yeah. And the I thing is, uh, is, I would uh, refer you to Star Trek First Contact and uh, uh, the episode of the original. Or what's the one with Zephram Cochran in the original? Metamorphosis. Series? That's it. Which See, this like, one kind of echoes oh, in a, in a, with the love story thing. But um, what was I going to say? Dunno. Before you interrupted me. Damn it, Scotty. Damn it, Scotty. <laughs> uh, oh, uh, I was going to oh, say. Oh. oh. <laughs> Penny. Oh, um, Penny just got her grandson down for mm -hmm. you. That's really sweet. I hope I hope we don't wake him up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but what I, I was going to oh. say. I what? do have to excuse myself. You oh. have the conch. Oh, is he going to? Okay, pick are up you his mom? are you going? Are you going to go pick up? Are you going to go on a mission? A mission, yes. Drive safe, Scotty. Yeah, drive safe. Be well. Hope Take everything. Care. Hope everything's okay with your mom. All the tests are are yep. 
A O K. Yes. Or four O. Four O, as they say in four O. Yeah. Uh, Jerome Bixby originally he was pressing for uh, Flint to be Beethoven, but for some reason NBC objected to that, or the or Freiburger brain uh, objected <laughs> to it, and they went, "No, we'll go with Brahms." It's like, no, Beethoven's fine. <laughs> Wow. Uh, yeah, in, anytime, anytime something weird happens, probably Fred Freiburger. Yeah, Freiburger brain. Reluctant Dragon says Carol O'Connor was oh. a British Army officer, Colonel yeah. Bill Southall, yeah. in an episode of The Time Tunnel. Very yeah. hard to accept in that role. That is correct, Reluctant well, Dragon. He I was forgot also, about that. He was also in the running for the skipper on Gilligan's Island. And also Ooh. in the running for Dr. Zachary Smith. Oh, wow. wow. Yes. Yeah, he actually tried for a lot of roles over the years before he finally yep. landed all in the family. He's like, good for him. Can... Yep. Mm -hmm. I couldn't imagine anybody else but Jonathan Harris being Dr. Smith. Interesting. Yeah. It's like, hmm, interesting. Yeah, definitely do that. So. They're about to go to this guy's castle. And so, yes, like Scotty, our 37 mentioned earlier, Kirk does threaten to have everybody destroyed if he can't get the right Italian because and then tell and tell the Enterprise crew, come and get it. Come and get come and get it, because this guy's not gonna let us and unless you know this is the only way. And so he's gonna save his crew no matter what. And the idea of that, that's that's good, but it uh the the threat as soon as the threat gets there, the threat is gone. So it, it, Constantinople it's over before you summer can feel it. 1334. It marched through the streets, the sewers. Yeah, the plague. The plague left the city by ox cart by sea to kill half of Europe. Mm. The rats rustling and squealing in the night as they too died. Oh. The Enterprise is a plague ship. Go away. <laughs> right? Like he he's he's a recluse. He's trying to stay away from humanity because he's escaped he, to this planet to be away from everyone. And this plague ship comes. And he he doesn't seem too concerned that he's that this is contagious. Yeah, he, even after McCoy says yeah, the he, people from the Rigelian fever die in one day. Yeah, he, day, like, oh, he doesn't have to worry day. about any disease. Oh, that's right, because his tissues regenerate. So he thinks he's it, because he thinks he's immortal. He's not afraid of disease. He's uh he's like Wolverine. <laughs> okay. Oh, oh, okay. Okay. That does without the adamantium. <laughs> <laughs> how how does his tissues regenerate? I don't think they're really it doesn't matter. What was that now? Um, I don't really think they say how he his tissues regenerate and no. how he became immortal. I don't think they do no. right. Yeah. It's uh it's just it's okay. They have a pretty castle. Yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's messed up. I'm surprised the NBC censors let all that you know, he says he's not only Methuselah, uh, he's also Solomon. And it's like, uh, Lazarus. No, I think, uh, well, yeah, which Lazarus, though? Is it, you know, <laughs> is it? <laughs> it's not that it, Lazarus. There's two Lazarus. There's one with Lazarus and the rich man that uh, Jesus uh, talks about. And uh, then there's the Lazarus, which Jesus raised from the dead. Uh Right, but, uh, but yeah, it's just it's like, look at you're going to tick off a lot of Jewish people and a lot of Christian, and uh, then they go, they they even have him say that he's Solomon. That's like, no, you can't do that. It's like Solomon is the uh, first surviving son of King David and Bathsheba, and he's part of the royal line or the royal bloodline or legal bloodline that leads to Messiah. And, uh, but of course, uh, Christians that know their Bible know that, uh, in the book of Jeremiah, God puts a blood curse on the, the royal line. And because the Kings became very, very terrible 
And King Jeconiah was the last straw for the Lord. And he put a blood curse and struck this man as childless. You're, no, so you're just explaining no, no, how it's illogical. No, off, no offspring will prosper. And so you have this problem with the bloodline being cursed. But <clears throat> if you look at the genealogies in Matthew, he talks about Christ the Messiah. And so he takes the legal or, or royal line because he's addressing a Jewish audience and he's a, a Levi. So he would do that logically. He would go through Solomon. But <clears throat> in the book of Luke, which emphasizes Christ, the son of man, he takes a, the genealogy is the same as in Matthew, except when it gets to uh, the second surviving son of King David and Bathsheba, which is Nathan. And so the genealogy continues through Nathan and it leads to the father of Mary, who is Heli. And so it's through Mary that Christ has a claim to the throne of David. And that's uh, one part of why it was a virgin birth, to circumvent this blood curse put on the royal bloodline. And uh, it's very interesting because Heli, uh, part of the Mosaic law was if there was a, Jewish man that had only daughters, <clears throat> his inheritance could pass through one of his daughters uh, if she married within the tribe. And so but basically, so, basically, all you're trying to say is that it doesn't really make sense for him to be all of these people because of all the historical events that have occurred. Right. And, and so right. the, they wouldn't quite line up for yeah, him to and, be uh, all Meth of them. Methuselah uh, means his death shall bring. And Methuselah was the son of Enoch, who is the oldest prophet in the Bible. And uh, Enoch uh, named his son that because God told him that he would withhold the global flood as long as his son lived. And so Methuselah has the longest lifespan. Uh, 900, like 900. 969 years, uh, and that was because of God's mercy in withholding the global flood, uh, the flood of Noah. So basically, the uh, you know, one the day that Methuselah died was when the flood came. Yeah, and then and then we get a rainbow, and there's a promise. Oh, I won't do that again. And yeah, so he, yeah, that's the uh, that's the the covenant, uh, the no you know, covenant with Noah. And, <laughs> but we're supposed to believe that Flint is all of these people. Yeah, it's like... We'll mm, into more of that at some point. I would have made him one of the four generals of Alexander the Great. That's where I would have started, uh, you know, and then he could, yeah, so if, you know... <laughs> so if you want to make a character all of these different people in Earth history, that's a really cool, interesting idea, but make sure you get it right. Yeah. <laughs> So, so Jerome Bixby does not know his Bible. Is basically, but I did notice this right away that Flint's castle looked like it was a uh, reused, and it is a reused matte painting from the Rigel and, Seven yeah. Fortress from the Cage. And I, I, what do you think of this? I, I like uh, the change. This is very. Uh, mm -hmm. It's nice. This is it's just majestic. <laughs> it's like. It like, is. It how is. did how did Flint build all that? <laughs> well, I'm so happy to just leave it on this page. I want to read yeah. a little bit from the 365 book, and then I'll check out the chat. Yeah. Well, the he, original how he built of, it, he had mm -hmm. a lot of robots to help him. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, he can just build those M4 robots like in an instant. Could later 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 on, Spock zaps one to death. Yeah, and he then, probably and has a it, whole a whole fleet then, of them, Jill. <laughs> yeah, and then another M4 robot appears out of nowhere. So, yep. yeah, yes, a whole fleet of robots build this castle. <laughs> that is a great theory. Yeah, he's got a lot of, a lot of helpers. <laughs> so the 365 book says the original version of Flint's castle was a reuse of the beautiful matte painting created by Albert Whitlock for The Cage. For Star Trek's remastered episode, the artists at... CBS Digital reinterpreted a number of such visual reruns to give each episode a unique identity and to accompany it one last literary portrait as provided by Michael and Denise Akuda. Weary of the human experience, 
the immortal man finally fled his homeland, seeking solitude on a distant planet. In splendid isolation on Holberg 917G, Flint would never again suffer the insanities of Earth society, the petty jealousies, the endless trivialities, and the horror of war. He spent years constructing his personal fortress, ironically inspired by Earth's Renaissance architecture. Flint designed his castle to provide for his every need and to facilitate his every intellectual pursuit. Equally important, it would protect him from meddlesome intruders and curiosity seekers. Yet, when it was finished, Flint found his great, to his greatest surprise that his life was still lacking. The man who had lived a thousand lifetimes discovered he still needed a woman's love. Wow, wow, that description is a lot more fun than the episode. I like that. I like that a lot. I hadn't read that before. So James Caserta says, It reminds me of a sci-fi story where an astronaut is taught an original waltz by Chopin. <laughs> um, yeah, that's essentially what happens here. Spock plays piano pieces by famous artists that don't, but these pieces don't actually exist, except they do now. You have known me by many names. One of them may have been Elton John. He's been. <laughs> that would have been rad to see this Spock is your play some song. Elton John or some Billy. Exactly. <laughs> and this is Candle in the Wind. Now, I have a question for everybody, and I don't know the answer myself. On that bridge, you will see Kirk, Spock, McCoy, and the other guy yeah. walking across that bridge. The original series, when it first aired, did they have the same people walking across that bridge? No. That's what I thought. That so was that's something about. Michael Kuda did. Did he? It, yeah. It's good. It's good. It's kind of similar to the addition that they made to a mock time when you see uh, Kirk Spock and McCoy walking across the, the bridge to the matrimonial arena. Mm. Yeah, fair Look. enough. Hello to Rod Thunderheart. He says, okay, so he says it in this way, hmm. and I have to read it in this way. Hail, Auntie Derivative Jill. And so he's, he's friendly. Hello, Rod. Good to see you, sir. The elegancy way to say my name, which is, of course, the way that Cardinal Sin used to address me. Uh, uh -huh. Yes, great to see you, Rod Thunderheart. And also really good to see you, Tommy and the Guinea Pig Collective. <laughs> Doggy hey, Prince. How is your Tuesday going? <laughs> James Caserta wonders if he was also Hitler. I don't think so. Man, that would really mess everything up. It's a very different episode if you look at it that way. <laughs> Penny says, Franco, that happens quite often when I'm texting in more than one screen. Oh, And so Cuphead and so Franco Walker's getting some tea. Hey, Franco. And the robot did it all. The reluctant dragon agrees. It's the only thing. <laughs> robot did that it. That makes any sense. The only thing is they didn't want to use any artists who were still alive. So that's why they didn't. He was also going to be Picasso. But they were like, no, he's alive. Don't do that. Will oh, that's still? right. Yeah. It's like, are you crazy, Jerome? I thought it was interesting because one of the paintings uh, was a Pollock. Yeah. But it wasn't a Jackson Pollock. It was like a Richard Pollock or something like that. Yeah, something seems, like that. Yeah. And it seems like they altered that to, you know, no, that guy's, I don't know. Was was Jackson Pollock still alive in 1969? I believe he was. Uh, otherwise known as Jack the Dripper. <laughs> uh, Jeez. They made it Reginald, Reginald Pollock. Reginald right. Pollock. Who right. dad? I don't he's know. A, I don't know, but he's a yeah. real artist. Yeah. Reginald, uh, Reginald Pollock is? Yeah. Oh, wow. And then hello to Richard. Darius Munchausen. Darius! Yeah, I think the only reason I know that is because the, the transcript for this episode, the fan-made transcript, ha had a link to a Wikipedia. Of oh, Oh, uh, Reginald Pollock's work. He's sweet. 
where is PVP when you need him and his fine arts degree? The and, thing is, uh, they didn't Jill... allow Picasso, but they allowed Reginald, who was alive. Anyway, oh, he yeah. was still. I was just going to ask you uh, uh, the years of his uh, existence, but you said he was still alive in '69. So it's like, okay, <laughs> hmm. Mm -hmm. maybe they had and his too. permission. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe he was maybe he was a himself. Star Trek fan. He goes, Yeah, go ahead. There we go. <laughs> oh, interesting Ooh. idea. He he was alive until two thousand one. So he, oh. he and born in twenty twenty four. So he was he was alive quite a bit. Two thousand and one. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh my best friend was he was married in uh, this in uh Let's see, that was June of 2001. As I told him, I said, you're getting married during the summer of sci-fi. Mm. The sci-fi channel was, you know, 2001, the summer right. of sci-fi. <laughs> the Reluctant Dragon says, I'm glad they didn't make him Leroy Neiman. I don't know who mm. that is. I don't know who that is, so I don't get the joke. <laughs> but Reluctant Dragon, I, I bow to your knowledge. Yeah, very knowledgeable, that Reluctant he, Dragon. He is. He knows his history. He knows and his stuff. One of the saddest things in this episode is we see some books, but we don't get to see the library. I was like, oh, man, this is the, we're, we're about to see a Renaissance man who knows all this stuff, and I want to see his books. They talk now, about the books. but Now, just, referring to the they books, don't, show don't they say there's an original Shakespeare portfolio? Yes. I'm like, oh, okay, so he's Shakespeare, too? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's he's like, everybody. okay. This is way over the top. Well, but there is there is a differentiation because Spock does notice the contemporary materials that are used to make mm -hmm. pretty much Da Vinci but, or but Brahms. also and yeah. uh, with with uh, when it when they refer to Shakespeare, they say that it is an original portfolio, and so I'm assuming yeah. he's taking into account the materials as well. So I would say he just it was a souvenir. Yeah, I was just going to qualify, you know, I was like, well, wait a minute, you know, let's, he just has a, in, because he's so old, he has an incredible collection. Yeah, so, yeah, so it's not necessarily that yeah, he's Not necessarily that I he's mean, Shakespeare, but he has, uh, like, he has a Gutenberg Bible, and so mm -hmm. he's got quite the collection. What's the baseball card that Kivas Fajo has in the most toys? And it's like, and it's kind of <laughs> in the little case, and you smell that? They used to call it Bubble gum. Bubble gum. Yeah. <laughs> did you Roger did you collect... Maris, 1962? Oh, Roger Maris, 62. There you go. Did <laughs> did any of you guys collect bubble gum cards of any kind? Anybody? Uh, I did. I yeah, used cool. To. Star Wars, yeah. Star Trek. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Batman. I I, I collected Batman I got the yeah, the Batman uh from the sixties, man. Uh Batman. And uh, my dad brought home uh, some bubblegum trading cards, and they were King Kong hmm. bubblegum like trading Jeff cards. Bridges, and and it's no 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 come on the sixties baby sixties okay. And uh, it was the original nineteen thirty three King Kong, nice. uh, but one exception was a still from uh, King Kong versus Godzilla. <laughs> nice. And it's like, wow, these are great. <laughs> and so the, this guy's supposed to have an amazing collection of things. And yeah, while, and he's got a great he, flat screen, too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, while you, That's right, exactly. So Reyna is watching on a flat screen TV. Yep. <laughs> that's exactly the lovely what I had And so, but they don't know that she's there just yet. She's spying. She's spying on mm -hmm. him. <laughs> McCoy says the creation of lithographs by Tar Taranolis of Centauri Seven. That's one of the rarest book collections in the galaxy, spanning centuries. So they had an in-universe special book that, that he has. Is this like Spock going to the best comic book store in the universe, or the best uh, DVD library in the universe? Yeah, he's nerding out, or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> That's exactly what he's doing. You have a this ghost most... trap from 1984 well, Ghostbuster? He did say envy. He's going yes. To... True. 
very yes. intending. It's yes. like it's like, ooh, I don't know if he would admit to that, but that's that is that is very interesting that he would admit to his human yeah. half coming out for this particular kind of collection. And I didn't get a chance to make clips of this episode like I often do, but one of the ones I might have gotten was when Spock says this is the most splendid private collection of art I've ever seen and most unique. The majority are the works of Leonardo da Vinci, Renaissance period, some of the works of Reginald Pollock, 20th century, and even a Sten from Marcus II. And so while he's nerding out about all the stuff in this collection, Reina is is nerding out about him she wants to discuss sub-dimensional physics with him and so i hadn't seen this episode in a long time and i was like wait are they doing this again didn't they just do this in the cloud minders where where uh where a uh, smart girl and spock bond over art and everything Droxine. and so yeah. i almost thought that was going to be the romance because honestly i haven't seen this episode in forever and uh, the romance is obviously between kirk and reina oh you didn't remember that no, oh, I, didn't, wow. I didn't remember a damn thing about this. Episode. Oh, wow. Yeah, this one uh, this one uh, stuck in my brain because I, I didn't see it when it was originally telecast, but I did see it when it was repeated uh, in September of 69. So because uh, I don't think I saw it, the original airing of it. But I think this episode is a lot better on the rewatch when you know that she's an android and we, you know that you, the, the emotions are the things that are being discovered within her. Yeah. Such as loneliness and love yeah. and all of that. And I do like some of the episode is poetry, the way that it's written. I do like when Flint says, um, responds to the question, what is loneliness? Yes. And he says, this is another clip I would have gotten. It is thirst. It is a flower dying in the desert. Yep. Very well, and, poetic. and I agree with the poetry. And initially, initially, Flint is so isolationist because he wants his solitude away from humanity. He's ob and as we learn to uh, we discover that Reina is his creation, a literal work of art. So there is a parallel to the, to uh, the cloud minders. But I uh, like McCoy responds to her because she says, Raina says, uh, I have never met any other man. And McCoy ever, the charmer, says, uh, well, that is to the detriment of men everywhere. So he's charming as all get out. Uh, Spock is taken by her intellect, but also, I would say to a certain extent, her warmth. And then Kirk is the object of her affection, which is what stirs everything, which is what makes Flint turn from being an isolationist okay take the take the ritalin right ritalin and ritalin. go and and that makes it it's like oh actually i can i can use i can use kirk to excite the emotions they'll get their medicine and get out of here and then i'll be you know i'll be the that, and then i'll have a, a robot who learns how to love me exactly so in terms of the progression of reina's character i'm pff, fine with it and I'm fine with everybody falling in love with her at first sight. It's just the problem is, is that Reyna fell in love with Kirk. This uh, has shades of Forbidden Planet. Of course. You know, it's uh, Altera. Of course, it's, uh, we all know that Forbidden Planet is loosely based on Shakespeare's The Tempest. Yes. And, right, because you got a, you got a hermit with the lady and who who doesn't who ha, who hasn't been in society doesn't know love although she, although in Altera isn't a android but no. yeah do you see the similarities well and one of the i guess this is something that is supported or at least i saw similarities it doesn't support my argument it's just similarities that i saw is that she is very much uh, Fam Kick Jansen's character from Perfect Mate in Star Trek The Next Generation, where there is a pheromone explanation for uh, Picard falling in love with Fam Kick Jansen's character. I don't want to say her name because it's a current vice president of the United States. 
Uh, and uh, yeah, and so I think that this is the fall in love inextricably. No, no explanation. Just you are, I am made for you, Ulrich of Galt, or whatever the name is. Like, this is just the Kirk falls in love episode. Like, hard, for no reason. And the reason... For no reason. Well, and this is... The reason that I can only surmise is we are talking about Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci, and he created a work of art in a woman, and Kirk being a Renaissance man, being the object of affection of such a picture of beauty, like a literal work of art as opposed to boasting, which happened with Droxine. Like, I think that this is something that Kirk would fall for. I, I and, don't think so. I and, really don't. Well, okay. That, that, that's where you and I differ. I think we were going like... to definitely differ on that one because All right. All right. Kirk, Kirk typically has a romantic association when it's an old girlfriend or if he's lost his memory or he's ah. found a soulmate, Edith Keeler, who had personality. There, there was, there was no social interaction really between Kirk and Raina, except they play pool and dance, but they don't really say anything. And well, so I don't really buy this romance at all. I don't, and I don't think that that Kirk would. Uh, if I may, two things. But first things first. Raina is a blonde. Uh, Raina is a blonde. Over the and I think it reminds Kirk of <laughs> Carol Marcus. Also, Raina is assertive with with jim we, uh, we don't know I about carol marcus yet <laughs> but well, she okay she did exist <laughs> she did exist well she was the little blonde lab technician that gary mitchell had steered towards Kirk oh your... yes that is the theory that is a good theory <laughs> so i think that kirk has a history of blondes uh edith keeler i think is his true love but whatever Yes, I do too. Edith Keeler War. Is, is his true love. He falls in love with her mind, her spirit, her soul. And this, what is she, what is he falling in love with here? I don't know. Nothing. Intellect, <laughs> beauty, emotion. The, yeah. Any, okay, she yeah. has that, but she's kind yeah. of, I don't know. She, she's not really projecting that she wants romance. Did you see them like, play billiards? Have yeah. you ever been to a pool hall and taken control of a man's cue like that? <laughs> No, I yeah. don't. Yeah, I, I, just, I don't. I really don't have a problem with the uh, with uh, the romance. But uh, again, uh, I uh, really uh, like. Well, we have Louis, somebody I heard of Louise Sorrel. So yes. I, we have a very special guest. A very special guest. Hello and welcome Bird of Prey to Bird Five. Of Prey Five. Hello, world. It's Bird of Prey Five. Kapla. Yay. Kapla. Hey, Bird, Bird of Prey. Five. Good to see Yay. you. Sorry for being so late. Good to see you. Oh no, welcome! I'm very Better glad you're here. Never. Hope you're doing well, sir. Not too bad. I, uh, I'll be honest. Uh, this episode I had not seen in a long time. I watched it this morning, though, and uh, yeah, I, um, I was just listening. I, I, I have to agree with Jill. I, I do not see why Kirk had any. You know, other than just being a man, but why this this what he had any love for this woman? Right. It, it just, was it, it was more nothing. like lust to me, like just pure. Like he was. I instinct. thought there was going to be some part of this. Like I'd forgotten this episode, and I thought there was going to be some part where it turned out Kirk was being drugged or something. Because right, exactly, didn't or had lost his memory, or or was yeah. feverish. Or possibly, maybe that's a maybe that's part of would Rogelian have expected, fever. I would have maybe expected it a, being maybe part it of is. that. Yeah, no, I, I, like I don't know hormones. It yeah, I uh, that's a very good point, Scotty. I I didn't really think of that, but that's that's a good enough theory for me. Because this is just, I mean, pretty <laughs> hard to write off that Kirk would just. Uh, well, once we get to the last scene of the episode, that's where everything goes off the rails. Well, me. speaking of getting to things, I do need to say <laughs> Louis, uh, Louise Sorrel is, Louis. of course, playing Ray Reina. She was 28 years old, and 
her one of her first jobs on TV was as William Shatner's wife. So she's been a love interest before for Build Your Houses with Their Backs to the Sea. That's a 1963 episode of Route 66. I don't know what any of that is except that he was she was uh, she played William Shatner's wife. And then she was also on with Shatner again um, on Barbary Coast, then oh, in wow. Movie of the Week, Perilous Voyage, and yes. in Airplane 2, the sequel. She was in Airplane 2? Wow. Now she is. Huh. They they have more history as actor and actresses. You'd think that this, this would have worked a little better. And uh, she, in she the Mark, married her in real life. In, yeah, in the Mark Cushman book, uh, Louise uh, talks about how flirtatious uh, and fun uh, William Shatner was. Why didn't they do that episode. on screen? Well, they do. Oh, I think the chemistry's there. The chemistry's there. I I think so. No. Again, we have to. You know, it's a one-hour episode, and they can only squeeze in so much so things have to happen quickly <laughs> yeah I, I unfortunately don't, I just don't, so i just don't see it all of their all of their flirtations and chemistry must have happened off camera sorrel admitted uh that she didn't she didn't know about science fiction or anything and so she she but she she did a she did a great job being an android who's yeah. confused about her emotions yeah she did she admits that she was at a loss of how to play the character and not being familiar with Star Trek or science fiction, but I think she did an outstanding job. It, it's interesting. Spock wanted to have a brandy. He wanted to drink some brandy. I, but and... I think that that sort of uh, is, he's taken aback by the emotion of seeing the collection that he has just absorbed. Mm -hmm. And so, and he, and again, the only problem with this, it, it, this is another retroactive one. It's like with a metabolism like his, he could eat a bowl full of termites and it wouldn't bother him. I, and in this one, it's like, right. Oh, we, do, we don't want a drunk Vulcan. And it's like, well, no, he's, he's had, he's tippled. Well, we just know for a matter of fact that alcohol doesn't really affect Vulcans, but it's like, when did we learn that? I'm not sure. Yeah, just having one drink isn't going to do anything to Spock. So I, I didn't have a problem with that. So, either, so, so his human half might be affected, but... Well, <laughs> <laughs> he has some human elements in his blood, but maybe that's enough to counteract any alcohol effects of alcohol so i don't know still flavor is flavor some people say that right, they so, order a glass of wine with a meal because so they enjoy the, the flavor there's also a bit of a contradiction i wanted to discuss spock says none of these paintings have ever been cataloged or reproduced they're unknown works apparently authentic to the last brush stroke and use of materials as undiscovered da vinci's they would be priceless would be do you mean they're fakes and so he, Spock says that they the tricorder analysis indicates that the canvas and pigments are of contemporary origin so and so they're authentic <laughs> in that they look exactly like a da Vinci would be but it's never been reproduced uh, but it, it uses contemporary things the con contemporary pigments although, their materials from the past so it seems a little bit mixed up what they're trying to say here i guess maybe it's reproductions of the materials that would have been used in the past but they were made like a month ago from m4 no no i do, no I, and if i may i apologize for saying no so many times it's the worst part of negotiation you're never supposed to say no um what he says is that the materials are contemporary. However, the technique is unmistakably of um, Da Vinci. But and it's a but he, but Spock also says uh, the materials are authentic to the time. So the materials well, used would have to be a reproduction of what they would have used in that period. But they're brand new. Because the robot just made them or something is what I'm trying to say. 
and and I accept that, and totally, you're you're right in terms of your uh, analysis. Now, my thing is, is that at the end, like when we do find out who Flint is, Kirk says to Spock, "You knew," and he says, "I had hoped it wasn't true, and I wish he had said I suspected, but dismissed it as like fanciful or something like that, something yeah. more Vulcan, right?" right. Okay, yeah, that's right. And so yeah. he's trying to piece together this mystery of how these these works from all these different artists are being produced that have never been produced before. But it looks exactly like this artist did this. Yeah. Like if somebody if um if somebody examined it, they would think, Hey, this is real. Charles and Schultz so... died three hundred years ago, but this isn't an for... peanuts comic. Oh yeah, right. That's exactly what it would be like if you no, make a new penis no, that, comic. That would be a good uh, Scotty R thirty seven parody of this episode. Oh, oh, I already do. Check out my ex uh, at Scotty R thirty seven. I've already said that I am one of the unknown flints. <laughs> X marks the spot, right? There it is. Oh, I forgot to broadcast a rumble. I always forget something. Oh, oh well, sorry to people who want to be over there. I'll upload it later over there. M4, okay, so M4 brings the Ritalian, but it's got a problem. It's it's full of the stuff. What is it full of? Impurities. Impurities. Yeah, but it has a yeah. specific name. It does. It's a. It's a... But I guess oh, that comes later. That comes later, actually. That's why I don't have it here. It's delays, delays, nothing but delays. There's mm -hmm. sand in this medicine. Yeah, it's like, I wish they, like, like it was discussed earlier, it should have been a you know a twelve hours. Please just give <laughs> it's like this I'm, crazy yeah. ticking clock. It's like uh. I'm absolutely with you on that. If they had just extended it, it's an arbitrary time limit, and they could yeah. have changed it to anything, something yes. just a tad more believable. I would have taken ten hours. <laughs> yeah, would you take ten? Yes, says Scotty. <laughs> Missed it by that much. <laughs> well, Raina wants to discuss field density with, with Spock. And he, he wants to do that. Yeah, he would appreciate that. But don't get excited like I did because this never happened. I thought random was thoughts with the survey off. says. Iridium? Iridium. Mm, iridium. It wasn't iridium. It wasn't? I thought it was. It sounded right. Something else. Highlighted. Hey, Bird, how you doing? Oh, Irelium. Irelium. That was Irelium. close. That was close. That was close. Thank you. Thank you, Gorilla. You got me to the, the right the right track. And so Reina Kapek is her name. And so that's a... Uh, this is a real... This is named after a real person... Czechoslovakian writer Carl K. Peck, who first yes. coined the term robot. Yes, Rossum's and... Universal Robots. You got mm -hmm. it. And, and so... there's in the Cushman book, there was some pushback. There we go. Uh, from NBC or DeForest Research for them using that. It's like, why not? <laughs> I thought yeah, it was cool. A cool either. reference. Yeah. Oh man, I have 62 chats. Let's see what's happening. In the Let's chat. see what's going on in the chat. <laughs> yeah. This episode ends with a rousing rendition of Crocodile Rock. <laughs> it's true. Hmm. It's not a widescreen, though, Prinkle Walker says. Oh man, he's <laughs> he's discriminatory. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it still has the black bars at the top and the bottom of the screen. <laughs> Yeah, but that's the first time you've seen a widescreen TV. Come on. Well, no flat screen. It isn't yeah. widescreen though. It yeah. is four by three. So well for art fans yeah. in and who are listening, Leroy Neiman was also is also the butt of a joke in Top Secret. It wasn't a romance, it was pure lust from Kirk Frank Walker. Yes, I agree completely with that. That works for me. I think that but I don't think he would go after pure lust. Don't they robots? <laughs> but I know, I know. Androids, Reluctant robots. Dragon. Androids, they're different. Don't, don't yeah. hate androids. Yeah, M4 is a robot. Reyna is an android. 
<laughs> hey, hello to Lemon Pie. Lemon Pie. Rod Thunderheart hello. says. Lemon. Oh, Rod Thunderheart. Friend. Good to see you. <laughs> well, that is the Rod. detriment of every man I love that uh, forgives if the voice. Oh, okay. I don't know exactly what Rod Thunderheart is saying, but thank you, Rod Thunderheart. I think he's he having trouble with his this. Phone. He's his referring phone. to uh, Bones' line mm, when mm -hmm. discussing that Reyna has not ever seen another Earth man. Right. And, and so Reyna, Reyna wanted to discuss field density and its relationship to gravity phenomena. Right. And so Gavin Blackburn says, Airplane 2 is the closest we came to understanding what that flashing light prop, the red flashing light prop actually is. I love that movie. William Shatner had my favorite joke on Airplane 2. When the captain makes a call to him and he appears on the view screen, they tell him the situation. And he says, why the hell wasn't I told about this? And that's uh, Rod, Rod Thunderheart. Hmm. I think Spock just wanted to test to see if the brandy was real. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. Man. Interesting. Not bad. Echoes of Trelane. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, right. It. Yes, it, it, it just looked like everything. Your it just, first, it didn't have any of the I, substance. I know. I got to find it. I don't even know where this is. You're absolutely oh. right, Gorilla. I did fail you. We all failed you. Oh. Uh, no, well, one. do I even know where that is? Well, I think I deserve this. <laughs> the agony booth is the most effective means of discipline. <laughs> oh my goodness, the agony booth. But I'm still looking. Yeah. Bill, do you want to look? Or I not? said, give me the brandy. <laughs> yeah, I can I can find it. I No, it's you work on the chat. I'll work on finding the brandy. It's uh, that evil Kirk. Yeah. Near the Kirk. enemy within. Yep. Oh, I want to live. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You find the brand. You find the brandy. I'll find the brandy. The brandy. The there yes. it is. It's under just really cool. Okay. So cool. You, you play that. Will do. That that's a that's a neat title. You don't you guys don't know what that means. I I have things in folders, and so that's the name of one of the folders. Made up stuff of yum. <laughs> <laughs> Aurelium. Hey, I still want to get it right, even if it's made up. Um, the reluctant dragon says Spock's choice of words are a good illustration of why you need a strong lore Bible and hold people to it. Unfortunately, season three didn't have the time or budget to worry about such things or even read the Bible that was already there. Fred yeah. Freiberger only watched six episodes. You can't be showrunner of a show and only watch six episodes of the freaking show. It's <laughs> ridiculous. Yeah, it's true. And uh, I do it for you, Jim. I said, give me the brandy. <laughs> and he got it. Yeah. Sorry, and brandy for all of us. <laughs> I'm still demoted. Ah. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, promotions come pretty easily here on this cruise, so you'll be okay. He he says celebrating live long and prosper day. We'll do this by lurking. Yes, happy happy birthday to the life and legend and memory of Leonard Nimoy. And so we get to enjoy him in this episode, at mm -hmm. least. Don't we'll be... mess. The what? Chill. The evil chill. Oh, I don't know what that means. I don't know. I've never met an so evil chill. Does a double dinger? Does Jill have a have a doppelganger? <laughs> Jill, did you go through the transporter and uh, no? <laughs> wake up in a different universe. Yeah, or did someone go through your transporter with a weird ore that had unusual properties? <laughs> weird science. Oh, that's even worse. Yeah, it's like no, it's like mirror Dax. As long or, as you didn't go through a transporter where, with a, mm -hmm. a plant that tends to combine you with your oh, worst no. enemy. My worst enemy. Oh, no. Plants are your worst enemy? No, no, no. <laughs> He's talking about Tuvix. Oh. Okay. Well, I don't, you know. I don't know who I'm going to be blind with. I don't know with. technically your worst enemy. 
I don't know. Least I don't know if I pleasant, have one. Least pleasant friend. Hmm. Oh no. <laughs> Eleven <laughs> of those. <laughs> oh no. There's plenty I could think of. Yeah. <laughs> oh fuck. Oh, but I do I do kind of like this. Um when McCoy says, What else interests you be besides gravity phenomena, Raina? And Raina says everything. Less than that is a betrayal of intellect. And Flint says, Raina possesses the equivalent of 17 university degrees in the sciences and arts. And so that's where you know she's not quite the age that she looks. That's a lot of degrees to be getting. 17, she is, huh? She is aware that intellect is not all, but its cultivation must come first or the individual makes errors. Well, she, like the actress is uh 29 as of the filming mm -hmm. of this episode and flint claims to have raised her at from infancy mm -hmm. and well that's obviously a lie he created well of her. course well no it's not a lie it just depends on what you consider infancy Activation oh right could be yes infancy. that's true that is infancy you're right but she and... looks like a full-grown woman when he creates her oh my is she like Kess? how old is she oh <sighs> Well, she has to be pretty old because she's got 17 degrees. Well, she's yes. also there's also 14 or 15 other ones of her failed oh, that's right. experiments. Oh, that's so right. And when each was one this is probably one given, the, given the knowledge of the previous one. So, she, yeah, she could be three years old. Yuck. Oh, I don't want to think of that. Scotty, why did you say that? Because we're talking true. about yeah. Star Trek and I wanted to bring up Star Trek things. I'll be in my booth. I know, but oh, gross. <laughs> Another worth, agony I, booth for Scotty. I think <laughs> she was well into her hundreds. That makes model. sense, too. You think so? I think well, so. Well, but they only said that uh, the, the pseudonym that Flint employed to buy this planet, quote unquote, buy this mm -hmm. planet, was 300 years ago. And we already have... Uh, uh, yeah. 14 or 15 okay, so attempts. This is this is Reina 16, as far as we can tell. But I think Data was young too. Yeah, but yeah. How old is Data? We don't like know that he didn't. He's 25. Yeah. Okay. So he yeah, so he wasn't he wasn't a baby. <laughs> no. He could he was of you know legal age, age of consent. Right. Okay. So so Tasha Yar is okay. She's yeah. clear. It uh, wasn't 300 years ago that the planet was purchased. It was 30 years ago. Oh, it was to, 30? My mistake. Yeah, by, from Uhura. Was, uh, the planet was purchased 30 years ago by a Mr. Brack, a wealthy financier and recluse, <laughs> alias Mr. Flint. <laughs> But that's a, that's a good point, because there are several different models, so we don't know how long this model had been in, uh, in yeah. effect. So did he, he made 14 or... 16. Reinas, 14. and he's been there for 30 years? So, yeah, no, she's... 30? I would assume a shorter... He's 6,000 years old. He but is, but do you planet. think he shipped, like, do you think he brought a whole bunch of android bodies to this planet i don't know where was he working on them before yeah i i'm i'm sure beta cannon and apocrypha can cover this i know that he was in the uh garfield and judith reeves uh stevens novel federation that sort of saddled uh the original series and the next generation era uh he was a sort of supporting character in that uh, but i just don't see him I don't see him having a ship that would bring multiple row or androids. I think that he probably made the androids on this planet. So I'm curious. Yeah, I'm just curious about the age. Yeah, probably. I don't know. But there's a curious bit of production history what here. If, is... What if Flint was Steve Jobs? And so he uh, built oh. in manufactured what's, what's her, obsolescence. What's her... What's her actor's name again? Louise. Louise Sorrell. Louise right. Sorrell. Wait, what, what were you saying? Oh, I was just saying that I, I, again, I'm just going off about the thing that I already said. I don't mean to repeat myself. 
Okay. But we were talking about obsolescence. And I would so say manufactured obsolescence. Got... In what but sense? He would, well, in he wouldn't be making something that would expire quickly. He wants to achieve right. immortality for his partner. And so Correct. this would be the latest. This is, this is the uh, iBook G4. This is, this is the new MacBook Air. This is mm -hmm. Windows 11. Yeah. He, and it's he only been around for approximately 18 months. Oh, maybe 18 months or 18 years or 300 years. We just don't know. True. So, so uh, she, the actress, what was her name again? Sorry. Louise Sorrell. Louise Sorrell. By Louise. the end of this live stream, I will remember Louise her Sorrell. name is Louise Sorrell. Just call her so, uh, Miss Night Gallery, like Scott <laughs> Skelton does. So Miss Night Gallery yeah. <laughs> was asked, do you play pool? And she says, I lied because every actor does. Do you ride a horse? Of course. Do you drive a car? <laughs> yeah. Yes. So of course I play pool. Truth is, I never even picked up a pool cue. I had not a clue, but I did not want him to be nervous because in the show there was this shot and I think it's called a three pocket shot where you hit the cue ball and knock three other balls into three different pockets all at once. Well, it's not well, it's not pool, it's billiards. And billiards is more of a bumper game as opposed to a pocket game. Well, of course, they assumed I wouldn't be able to make that shot, so they had a double there who could pop in and do that for me after they had filmed me doing all the setup. Well, lo and behold, beginner's luck. I made the shot. Nobody could believe it, including me, of course, because I didn't know what I was doing. But I did the shot. You can see it on the screen. But I couldn't believe it, nor the cameraman, because they were waiting to put the double in. So, I, thought I thought it that was, was so shaky. Me too. When they took the shot, I was like, why would they even include this? I, 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 it was terrible. I don't have a camera. It noticeably took me out of the, yes. the zone. Well, but anyway. her, yeah, right. She made such a cool shot and they didn't even shoot it well, did they? But there have been a couple of shots in this episode uh, in terms of the production that are very shaky. And I would attribute that to two things. The obvious one being season three. We are tight on time, tight on money. And the last three directors got fired for going over budget and over time or even just over time. And also, I think... It has something to do, you know, when they do cooking shows and they show the overhead view of the pans and pots, that's because the camera is shooting up at a mirror. And so maybe they were just going through these shots so quickly and something bumped like it well, is very shaky. Even in the remaster, they don't uh, they don't sort of steady it. There's one other explanation. Al Francis was homesick for the first three days of production. So John Finger, the director of photography on Gomer Pyle, USMC, and other stuff. Yeah. Um, Everybody always blames days. Gomer. Yeah. I'm going to blame Gomer. <laughs> it Go was <laughs> Gomer. Surprise, surprise, surprise. Search and That's Gordon. a possibility. And so she's showing Captain Kirk how to play pool, I guess, and he still still misses the shot. Oh, look, it's Scotty. Why did we get Scotty? Oh, I was wondering. I thought I saw a Scotty. Scotty I did. I did. I did. Uh, <laughs> I thought I seen a Scotty. I thought I did. Uh. Yeah, so they're they're having their whatever. But then they have the this this random dialogue that is kind of cool, but kind of a little bit outside of the episode. Why don't you play the waltz? And so now Spock is going to play the waltz that by Brahms that doesn't exist. Except it does exist now. Because Spock is playing uh it. There was an interesting comment by Jerome Bixby in the Cushman book where he was musically inclined uh, or very learned in, in music. And he was saying that he could do a, a uh, you know, some, uh, you know, some musical piece based on Beethoven. 
quite easily and and he had volunteered that but they this pushback on having flint be beethoven for some reason <laughs> so it prevented that so they had somebody else to do this uh brahms bit mm -hmm. yeah right the brahms paraphrase was written by ivan ditmers and oh did he work on a another Star Trek show? Like, I feel like he did something else, but I forget what. Let me see. Yeah, he's given a, a credit at the end uh, for, for the paraphrase, as you said. And that's really all I'm familiar with. Well, let me see. I want to check. But the captain's dogs, uh, I think, are objecting. No. <laughs> they are. Who knows okay, so he also he, he also worked on the Squire of Gothos. So he, oh, he, sweet, yeah, good memory. He performed Jill. "Roses of the South" by Joanne Strauss too. Uh huh. And interesting. So he and, he's the one playing for Trelane then. Yeah, and two sonnet sontanas by Domenico Scarlatti. Yeah, exactly. Trilling looks like he's playing for sure. Mm -hmm. There you go. Sweet. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jill. That was You're welcome. Some great Trek trivia. Mm -hmm. Boy. Oh, and there's apparently some blooper reel. I didn't get the blooper reel. And so oh, but there's it. There's it. Sorry. <laughs> I'm just gonna mention it. I'm sorry I don't have that. Yeah, uh, I know wh you which had it. Uh which particular you gotta get blooper? monetized so you can so you can upload it again. Which uh, particular blooper were you referring to? It it was one where Leonard Nimoy was rocking his head, head sarcastically while Phil in elevator music plays hmm. while, oh. he's, while he's while he's playing the oh. <laughs> the Brahms waltz. Okay. <sighs> okay. And so Aurelium is in oh Yes, Pop? I was just thinking that hair must wear 10, weigh 10 pounds. Star Trek love blonde women. All Sorry, right. just an observation. Yeah, no, I bet. Well, yeah, this was that, uh, got that big thing in the middle. Yeah, it was uh, Louise Sorrel that uh, suggested being uh, a blonde because she had never. Oh, I know. I know. Uh -huh. But, start but you are right, Pop. Oh yeah, you're you're quite correct. So it's uh, that's I thought that was an interesting choice because it's kind of like, well, she doesn't know Star Trek at all, and yet it's like, oh well, you fit in right, you fit right in with the blonde hair. <laughs> so it's like, yeah. Don't be afraid, Reina. Don't, don't be, be afraid. afraid. Well, you know what? It's that kind of behavior that would actually make me afraid. No, it's Captain Kirk, Jill. Come on. <laughs> it's just kind of, I don't know. It's kind of weird the way he does it. Yeah, I agree. But uh, I, uh, I'm i a toxic male. I'm going to let on. pass. Don't, okay. <laughs> don't be afraid. What else do you want your guys to say? <laughs> you can trust us. I mean, me. I mean, him. <laughs> I mean, you can well, trust Captain Kirk. Yes. Well, it, apparently Flint agrees with me because he has M4 come to try. I'm like, I don't agree uh -oh. with, with M4 killing Captain Kirk, though, but that is exactly what it, he's about to do before Spock destroys M M4. But don't yeah. worry, Flint can make 100 more M4s pretty easily. Yes, it's uh, some, uh, some injected drama on this talky talk episode. <laughs> Well, it's just that Kirk is usually so good at being romantic, and it's just weird to see him a little less than. And it's just odd. Well, I blame the writer. <laughs> I blame the writer, too. I I, and man. the director. And the I blame everybody. <laughs> they should have said... I blame the, the writer. I blame the director. Yeah. I blame Fred Freiberg. Yeah, they should have said, yeah, we need, we need, uh, we need uh, to polish this uh, romantic stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
pretty shitty. And, oh, oh, one thing I did, <laughs> I did like, I do like certain bits of it. And it's usually whenever Spock says something, I do like when he says this. What does he say here? He says something about the phaser work. Yeah, you just like, had, like, yeah. Because we established earlier that the robot nullifies your phaser. So fortunately, the robot didn't detect my phaser. So my presence, so I could use my phaser. And so that explains something that would have been a plot hole had he not said that. That's nice. So uh, I don't know what's drawn. The, the, the M4 was, was hopping mad at Kirk and was totally focused on destroy Kirk. Mm -hmm. So Spock was able to sneak up on him. Yep. Right. M4 was too distracted. Well, go back to that slide. That's my dream house, Jill. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got to get to work. That's a lot of that's a lot of building you have to do. I, I, I'll have. Like uh, I'll get uh, some. Uh, I'll get some. Uh, center. Sorry. What? What's that? Uh, so it looks like an observatory there in the mm -hmm. center. Yeah, yeah, you are correct, sir. That there is, is an a, observatory. Yeah. There is or was a house in Sedona, Arizona. That had its own observatory. Oh, that's neat. Uh, huge, sprawling place, uh, similar to that actually, uh, set up among the, the red rocks. Uh, it was right across from uh, the Holy Chapel. Um, anyway, I saw that place under construction when I was there in the year two thousand. And then I was back in 2003 and 2004. They had just finished being built. And it was the most amazing place. Uh, last I heard, it was sold for over $10 million. Wow. And the newest people took down the observatory. Uh, I was so upset. Oh, that's terrible. What jerks? Jerks. Really? All that money. <laughs> Uh, Why would you tear down the observatory? Yeah, observatory. What the heck? It's terrible. Uh, that, that, that's one of my childhood dreams was to have a castle and have a, a telescope observatory and all of that stuff. And I, mm -hmm. I never, I never really did me that. But gosh, to to spend all that money, like you said, on something so yeah. magnificent and then tear it down. Yeah, Screw that's a, guys. that's that's a darn shame. That's it just is. inexcusable. <laughs> Damn it! Yeah. So this is <laughs> this is Jill's uh, dream house as well. It has an observatory. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. That was fine. That was something new. James oh, Caserta says yeah. Jill is an all-powerful triple. So oh no, the triple's <laughs> angry. Yeah, the triple's angry at James Caserta. Watch out for those damn triples. It's like, well, he's uh, he's being mean to Jill. <laughs> Jill yeah. does live with a Klingon, so I would not blame anybody in the chat. <laughs> I do live with a Klingon, and so the Tribble gets tossed about. The other day, the Tribble got punched. Oh, that's too bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Your agonizer, please. <laughs> no, Mr. Spock. <laughs> oh. Don 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 Ranger Power says not to be confused with the villain from Ranger Power Rangers Mega Force. Go Mega. Wait a minute. What was yeah, Don talking about? Don Don uh, <laughs> Ranger Power. He's always referring to the Power Rangers. I just don't mm -hmm. get it. Yes. I don't well, get it. <laughs> it's because he's either. more phenomenal. That's he's awesome. <laughs> he has passion, and I respect his passion. Yeah, he's a, he's a he's a morphin and a power a ranger. Yeah, he's he is mighty, mighty and he is morphing, yeah. he is powerful, <laughs> and he is a ranger. I love the way the reluctant dragon describes M4. M4 has no man's head or a butt. Oh, I'm I'm shocked at this this kind of talk, reluctant dragon. Oh. <laughs> really? <laughs> no, he's right. <laughs> Which one? He's right mm -hmm. about about uh, M4 having having mm -hmm. no yeah, match right. no well, head for a butt. Just a great way to describe it. 
James Caserta says uh, Kirk's libido led the way. Yes. Mm-hmm. I am in love Raina. with Raina. I'm in love with Raina. Therefore, Kirk is in love with Raina. There. I said it. That explains it all. Now, Tommy I know, I know, I know I've know. i said before. Oh, hey. That... Uh, wait a minute. Tommy's got to go. I got to say oh, bye, dear. Tommy. Thank you so much for bye, stopping Bye, Tommy. By. Take care. And I hope you take care, Tommy. make great progress on your projects and have a wonderful rest of your Tuesday. Cheers, Tommy. Indeed. Wet Tuesday over here. Yeah, it's kind of gray and drizzly where I am. It's kind of, right. you know, it's, the sun came out a little bit yesterday, but I, I, I want the sun, doggone it. It's like, but here, so dreary. Here <laughs> clear purple skies. On wow. Wolgameth 473 or whatever this planet is called. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, purple scotty. Yeah, I was going to say that, you know, I, I always talk about how fantastic uh, Andrea the, the android is. But but uh, Reyna is the android that I would bring home to mother. Mm. <laughs> well, it's interesting that you would put it that way because, like, this is it having aired on February 14th. And this seems to be not only The Tempest, which I suppose is an, an analog, analogous for uh, this is this is a suitor coming to take away a daughter from a father and there you go this is something that feels like even at the end when kirk says to flint i'm not trying to beat you and it's it's not a matter of of someone's love overcoming that of another and even spock says later on he says reyna loved you jim and but also you mr flint because like uh, one is a mentor, one is a father, and you were to let her go into the arms of her suitor, and you didn't, and that's where her sort of blossoming of emotion came from, and that's why she shut down as an android. Mm -hmm. All right, right, because she didn't, she didn't, she couldn't make the choice, nor should she have to. Yeah. In fact, her own choices are the things that empower her. I like, I like, I never really was a big fan of uh, Louise Sorrel in this. I have grown to become a fan of hers over the years. She's a great Star Trek ambassador. She's proud of her work. And also she aged incredibly. Wow. Like she looks great. But I just, I, I really... I think that she did a great job and I am curious about more of her work. And I guess I should somewhat apologize for wanting to go see airplane two first and foremost. <laughs> <laughs> don't, so, uh, you don't have to apologize for it, but before we move on mm -hmm. with what stone racket is going to say, I have to mention one thing. We are talking a lot about how Kirk falls in love and whether this is a realistic version of how he would, do such a thing and we might agree or disagree on how he should go about that but one of the things where we don't mention is how incredibly keen spock is towards being able to recognize emotion even more than captain kirk during this episode which is a little bit strange but also i i always attribute that to the fact that vulcans even though they suppress their emotions they have them very strongly and so they they understand them maybe even more deeply than we do. And so well, Spock being so intelligent on that matter doesn't bother me as much as my instincts want it to bother me. I think it's very, uh, a, like as a character moment for the friendship between Kirk and Spock, Spock is, uh, he's not Spock blocking, but he is, he is sitting there and being like Jim uh ta 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 we have we got a yeah we got everybody sick on the ship even though scotty and her look okay they must have just contracted it and maybe they have environmental controls on the bridge that filter the uh the air better maybe i don't know he says nearly everybody has got it so i guess well, maybe they don't yeah i would assume that they don't because scotty uh he's in command and he he looks like he's he's doing uh a good job and same with uhura so i think they're all healthy there on the bridge so yep well 
And not only that, but uh, even McCoy says when they're on the planet, it's like if we wait longer than six hours or whatever, like the window is in two at two point two hours. And if we don't get it by then, we'll all be dead. And I think the implication is, is that everybody is infected. Everyone has the fever that can only be cured by more cowbell. The fever, oh yeah. In the form of Ritalin. <laughs> yeah. Or Ritalin. Ritalin is the cowbell. It's the cowbell. cowbell. Ritalin. I was <laughs> going to ask you, Scotty, since you were talking about Louise Sorrell, uh, did did you happen to get a chance to meet her like at a convention or, or something? or? Only, no, I, I never, I've never spoken her, to her in person. I just huh. refer to her in, in the televised uh, and recorded uh, interviews that I, I think we've all seen. And, okay, so Flint is 6,000 years old. This is being revealed by Spock, who's, but there, there's no history on either of them, either Flint nor Reyna, and... The events of the episode make it obvious as to why that is, because Flint's everybody and Reyna is uh, Andrew. <laughs> Flint okay. is everybody and Reyna is nobody. Oh no! Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to have to. I'm going to. You're going to have to excuse me. I need to take a moment here. I'm going to have a little cry. <laughs> well, yeah, Spock says it during the fight. He uh, Kirk says, I'm, "We're fighting over a woman." And, and so no, I'm you're not. Not a woman. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, pardon Hello. me. Excuse not me for just one moment. She's an we'll android. We'll get to the Jim. fight. We'll get to the fight. <laughs> yeah, and that boy, what a clumsy choreographed fight. Boy, oh boy. But anyway. <laughs> yeah, right now, right now, Raina and Flint are watching Kirk and Spock, <laughs> and as we're watching Kirk and Spock, as you're watching us. And uh, he's trying to convince her that he was. Oh, I wasn't trying to kill Captain Kirk. I don't want him dead. Of course not. No, please believe me. I wasn't jealous. I mean, oh, I mean. Uh... And th this is oh, this is the this is the cornerstone. This is the cornerstone of the episode where his motives change. At first, he's like, oh, they want this this drug. I got to get him out of here. And this is the point where he's like, wait a minute. Captain Kirk is doing something to to Raina that I like, and mm -hmm. this is it's a weird it's weird it's weird it's so weird. But he wants he wants Captain Kirk to draw the capability of love out of Raina. Yeah. So that, he, but I don't think the episode. It's not draw capability of love. Let's be honest. He it's wants weird. to get her excited in a way that she's not been excited before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, I agreed. Hot and bothered. It's just that the episode doesn't really make you feel that, and you don't realize it until the very end of the episode. So this episode's much better rewatching it with that knowledge. Yes. I, for all practical purposes, watched it for the first time, and I felt immediately, once it was clear the way he said it, I was like, oh, he's trying to to teach her to, to physically yes. love him. And, and I, I saw well, that, to be fully functional, yes. Yeah, exactly. And I saw that. I saw that the first time. I don't I well, didn't there, see the second. There is but. there is a moment where Flint attempts to kiss Raina, and Raina just doesn't know what to do with that motion, not emotion, <laughs> but just right. him him attempting to kiss her, and she's like, "What the what?" And that one, that first time it happened, I was genuinely a little a little confused. So I was like, "Okay," but then when with Kirk, and she still doesn't really get it, I was like, "Okay, so this is for all practical purposes, a child." She doesn't know what to do. Yeah, and the creepiest and, thing, I think somebody said um, Kirk is like a creepy uncle in this episode. I completely agree. And what? Uh, Gorilla's random thought says, see, exactly my point. He is a cuck. <laughs> so that's talking about Flint. 
And so the the usefulness, of course, being that Kirk gets her to understand the full meaning of having a passionate kiss. Yeah. What exactly is come to understanding here? Well, the, the childhood thing is in the dialogue. Kirk says, childhood must end. You love me, not Flint. I, I don't know. I, I don't really believe that Kirk would say anything like this. I, I think that part of the reason why Kirk is so taken by Raina is because of her uh, sort of laser focus on Kirk. I think that I think that her awakening of emotion is based on seeing James Kirk and take with that what you will take from that what you will. Uh -huh. uh, but I think that that is part of the reason why Kirk is so taken, because if you see what would be considered uh, the most attractive woman in the galaxy, as all three well, of she, our heroes she is. She's do. Gorgeous, but that's not well, no. And even me. her intellect, her her capacity for in like for curiosity, everybody is totes into her. And the reason that Kirk is more into her is because she is into him. And so I do understand when people say that, OK, Kirk's following his libido. He's lusting after her. But people reciprocate attention with attention. And I think that that's part of the reason that Kirk is sort of uh, influenced here. Also, it was a, it was an artificial human who was created by Leonardo da Vinci. So let's not forget the insight into humanity that that particular artist may have. Oh, for sure. Yeah, he he did. He was a artist of uh... quite some repute. Mm -hmm. He he did he did draw the human form quite a bit. Well, the Mona Lisa happens to be very very popular until people throw tomato soup on it. Oh no! But it fortunately it's protected. I don't know why people do that. It's so ridiculous. Yeah, I like the the fact that they. That he ma they uh, made him Da Vinci. You know, he's the epitome of the Renaissance man. The Renaissance Which, man who gets jealous and wants to kill Captain Kirk. Okay, of me. course, drama. <laughs> but also, like uh, people have have called Kirk in terms of Star Trek. The one of the uh, he is a Renaissance man himself. Oh yeah, yeah. Gary Seven says it and. Where no man has gone before about how Kirk was a professor and like I guess I guess maybe he was like Gary a Mitchell or something. Yeah, you said Gary, Gary Seven. Why Gary did Mitchell. I say Gary Seven? I meant Don't Gary know. Mitchell. Ah, oh, Gary yeah, Mitchell. Yeah, Gary Mitchell. We know what you're talking about. Yeah. Well, you know what a I'm talking about. Stack of books with legs. Look that's, out for Lieutenant that's Kirk. That's what I meant. Yeah. <laughs> if I hadn't aimed that little blonde technician, I I blame I blame my car accident for that mistake. <laughs> Flint lied. Laura <laughs> Talon. Oh yeah. So he, even okay. So he just said that's the end of the usefulness of Captain Kirk. She can kiss now, so Kirk can go now. But yet the Italian is still being hidden. So you would think he'd throw the Italian at him and be like, "Get out of here!" But I guess we. Well, no, it's again. Time, the it's time for the big reveal. The rapidity of uh, events under a four hour bracket, like it does make sense that he was like, I'm just going to keep, I'm going to keep throwing things at it. And like, he doesn't know how quickly it's going to happen. I don't, I don't think that they're holding our heroes here longer than is necessary. I think that he was like, oh, I just found out. And then that's when he comes and confronts them in this, uh, you know, super secret uh, oh. clone base. Fair enough. Reign of 16. It's just. She's bald. <laughs> it's Ilea. It's just uh, all the pieces, all the pieces make sense in this episode. It's just it kind of doesn't fit together properly on screen somehow. And it, it, I can't, I can't explain it better than just asking you to go watch the episode, and you'll see what I mean. So, and that's, uh, there's Louise with her natural hair. 
Hmm. Oh, cool. Okay. So that was her real hair. That was her real hair. Yeah. And not the one where she was bald. No, she Raya had a, a, it was a really well done bald cap. I must say the makeup on that was really well done. Well, if you look at the back of her neck, you can see where they were. They, they sort of tucked her hair. No, no, I didn't see that. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Damn it, Scotty. Damn it, Scotty. <laughs> she looked like a stegosaurus. The means down. of production. <laughs> I nice. am Brahms and Da Vinci, hey. but I won't talk about biblical characters. Oh, no, he did. Oh, oh. yeah. <laughs> he spoke like by definition, Flint. He said that he met Moses. He said that he met Moses. He yeah, he met Moses. he met the greatest minds he encountered and uh, Moses and Socrates and uh, what else? Stanley. Stanley. <laughs> yeah. Um, somebody's eating, so I'm gonna I'm gonna just um, mute that. It's not me. And and also Yeah, Jinch, we're getting a lot of background noise. I, I took care I took care of it. Whenever you're done with whatever you're doing, you may unmute. Flint says he's Solomon, Alexander, Lazarus, Methuselah. Well Stone Racket went on and on about the biblical stuff earlier, so I think we covered that. Merlin, Abram, son. And a hundred other names you do not Who's know. Who's Abramson? Probably some that, uh, Star Trekian future guy. Star Trekian? Yeah, maybe. I don't know. That didn't, Neither the do name I. didn't ring a, bell, ring a bell with me. Yeah, and if it if it was something from the Bible, Stone Rock would have known it because he's he knows his history there. He's a real expert there on that. But there's something in the 365 book, so I'd like to read it. Oh, I don't cool. even know Ooh. what it is. I just threw it in this location. So let's see if it makes sense here. <clears throat> red four standing by oh blint as he refers to himself in requiem for methuselah was born some six thousand years ago in earth's mesopotamian region kirk McCoy and Spock are startled to discover that flint not only knew some of the greatest minds in history he was one or actually several, including Leonardo, Solomon, Alexander the Great, Lazarus, Methuselah, and even the mythical Merlin. Oh, yeah, I forgot about Merlin. Yeah, Merlin was dope. Spock seems particularly taken by Flint's recent Brahmism. Brahmsian. Brahmsian. Brahmsian, yeah. Brahmsian, Brahmsian composition. Yeah. So taken that he sits down and plays a waltz on a convenient piano credited with creating the Brahmsian paraphrase for the episode was Ivan Dittmers a composer orchestra leader and musical director who worked in radio and television from the 1940s through the 1980s one of Dittmers longest musical gigs was on the popular tv show let's make a deal like many tv shows of that era the music on deal was live and it was Dittmer's job to come in each day and score the melodies that would be performed on the air. At showtime, he would play the piano and organ while conducting three other musicians. He was the game. He was with the game show from its debut in 1963 through 1976, when production moved from Los Angeles to Las Vegas and switched to pre-recorded music. I'll take door number three. <laughs> you don't want what's in the box? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Monty Hall, let's make a deal. I'm dressed yeah. as an asparagus. <laughs> it's funny you should say that, Scotty, because uh, that's what Dr. Smith becomes in a... Uh, episode oh my Star god Trek. okay anyway we'll, we'll, you we'll terrible lock... terrible human <laughs> i mean moisture. i don't, don't want to hear about the vegetable rebellion until we get there yeah yeah i'm gonna have to Dr. watch Pardon me Pardon. i want to watch it <laughs> i i i'm going through my first watch anybody listening uh lost in space and so i have not mm -hmm. yet seen this infamous episode but dr mccoy does explain how flint is immortal has been all these people he's got instant tissue regeneration coupled with some perfect form of biological renewal he's Wolverine. You learned, 
that you were immortal. And of course, Flint wanted to prevent other people to figure it out. And so now that he, you know who he is, they know who he is. They're like, he's like, well, now you can't leave because you know who I am. Because I don't want anybody to find out who I am. But Kirk's like, no, I promise we won't tell. But we all of tell. this, all of this we super promise. interesting stuff. I'm so into who Flint is and him being 6,000 years old and all these people. But they get distracted, of course, because Raina is, is, uh, is, is the creation, the perfect ultimate woman, as brilliant, as immortal as yourself, says Spock. Your mate for all time. And then says, designed by, by my heart, I could not love her more. And so since now they know his secret, the Enterprise cannot leave. And so he brings out a small remote control device and brings the Enterprise into onto the planet. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so the model. See, From yeah, the, Gene, this is Gene Roddenberry's desk. Mm hmm. <laughs> Yes, this is the three foot model starship. And but in in the episode it's really the ship with the crew members frozen inside like 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 little figurines. And uh Which, there's a big goof with uh it's like Kirk should be looking through the dome, the upper dome. It's like the view screen is not a window port. Right. <laughs> oh like, good point. Well all right, let me ask. So when they are traveling in space, it is sensors that are looking forward. And so when they are looking through the viewport, I agree it is not a window. But when they're looking for, through the view screen, that is what is happening directly in front of them. Every mm -hmm. indication that we have seen throughout the series is veer off and then you'll see a ship sort of go to the left or the right as the enterprise is turning you still see what is directly in front of them and so no that's not what i meant i meant oh. kirk should be looking through the uh dome window the top on top part. of the bridge oh. and and they should be and the view screen should be showing him at that angle if you want i don't know or it would be you it would you wouldn't see his face of course but you'd see his navel that's why his, you wanted to talk about yeah. it no i you would see his you would see his uh emblem on his shirt no uh <laughs> yeah but yeah i mean i know why they did it's it's dramatic reasons mm -hmm. but it just it makes anyway. more sense later when q does it to the voyager yeah well and what I, I, I don't know what that means but that's okay i'll take take your word for it <laughs> i'm oh no fine with it Oh no! It's the push button thing that magically mm -hmm. makes the Enterprise shrink. Yeah, it's like, well, no, wait a minute. I guess now he is. Sh he is shrink. Merlin. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so the crew is suspended, and he's going to suspend them for two thousand years. Two thousand, not one thousand, not fifteen hundred. There two thousand years. And there he is. Oh, I want that. Mm -hmm. I have one. Yeah. No, wait! I threw it away. Oh no. <laughs> At one time, I built six of those ships. Awesome. Yeah, yeah I built, uh, I had several of the AMT model kits because those mm -hmm. darn things kept breaking. <laughs> I know. Did you really I throw know. away a model of the Enterprise? You know, the Howdy. Playmates, uh, the Playmates toy with the. Oh, uh, yeah, I was that. tempted to get that, but I just don't have any place to put it. I just don't have any room. But no, boy, I but I, the one. Do you have it? Well, I used to. I had it. Uh, I bought it when uh, Star Trek was at its rock star popularity in like the mid 90s. And I had it for a very, very long time. But then after a while, the nacelles started oh. to sag. They broke off. The battery wasn't oh. working. I didn't have the stand anymore. Uh, yeah. And so eventually it just became plastic garbage. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm. I'm sorry. I misunderstood. I misunderstood you, Scotty. Uh, I was. I was referring to the Playmobil version of the <laughs> oh, Enterprise. Yeah, no. Have I, you seen that? I don't, it's like. Yeah, I've but seen that, it. I don't have that that's much money, a nor would I. Yeah, yeah, I don't have room that. for that, but I was so tempted to get it. It's like, but I'm so oh, sad so to cool. hear that Scotty R37's Enterprise melted. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's too my bad. My God, Scott, what have you done? What have you done? Turned life <laughs> he gave us or turned chance. death into a fighting chance to live? Yeah, yeah there you go. Yep. 
I got another rep. I I do have a refit Enterprise uh, as a replacement, and so I don't feel all that bad. Oh, no, that's good. Yeah, I have a I have a Diamond Select uh, movie. Uh, well, the refit from Wrath of Khan, uh, and the motion picture, and the motion picture. So I, it's it's technically it's a Diamond Select Wrath of Khan enterprise that's why i said rather calm but yeah it's also a motion picture but i agree with everyone i want that one yeah that's what <laughs> I, want. I want the real one yeah that uh i should clar- say- i should clarify that it ended up on roddenberry's desk after the production of the show ended so mm-hmm. some people say that they like the refit better than the original and i just i'm like jadzia dax i love the 23rd century design mm-hmm. i do yeah, too I- I like the refit, but I I know oh, what you mean. I, I I love the original as well. So I would have I would have one of each. <laughs> I'd like to have all six. Oh, there you go. In your Star Trek room of your house. <laughs> yes. As soon as I get a house, I will get a yeah. Star Trek room. <laughs> Same here. <laughs> I just have a small condo. And it's like I need another room just for my Star Trek stuff. <laughs> exactly. So, so this is the part where Reina enters the picture, and I, I have to step away for just a minute. I'll be right, right back. But before I go, can you start the last chat so we can go through the chat a little bit? Oh, uh, oh, you want to go through the chat? Okay. Unless that's you want to wait, people yes, are here no, no, to no. hear you. No, 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 that's okay. No, um, just make sure you do a good job of it. Uh, the okay, the last chat <laughs> is this one right here. This is the okay. last one I was on. Rock and roll, cola. Wars. Do you see it? It was uh, a well, reluctant um, dragon. Yes, reluctant dragon two forty two. Your time. Yeah. Uh, the reluctant dragon says, uh, "TNG seasons one and two are the waste paper age of Star <laughs> Trek, but at least they aren't any sort of STD." I agree. Yep. Totally agree with that. Fair assessment. Uh, Gorilla's random thoughts oh. says, "We got a big ice storm." Oh dear. I trust that you are stay um, safe, Gorilla. Yes. Uh, James Cassiter says Beningarius Seven Skies, the purple kind. Beningarius. The violet. Yes. Already. And for the, or there's a there's a cloud that's shaped like a dragon. Mm. Which a is Spock, dragon. Which Spock saw on Ben Garius Seven. He saw uh, a real a- dragon. <laughs> Franco Walker, uh, with good advice. Don't forget to please subscribe, share, hit like, and select live chat. Yes, indeed. So you can play with all the fun. Uh, Taylor Swift, greater than Disney, Star Wars, and MCU, says tau, 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 which I appreciate. I'm sure you can see that on YouTube. I do not uh, see what those uh, lovely stickers were. James Caceres says, Reina is everything. <sighs> I know you guys are fans and I'm trying to defend her character, but there is something about her. She's not my favorite. She's not my favorite Trek girl. She's one of my favorites. Definitely. I'm much more of a Kalinda. Gorilla's random thoughts says, see exactly my point. He is a cuck. He is. And Flint. goes on, goes on to say uh, fully functional in multiple techniques. Indeed, the romance is not lost on Reyna. Uh, and Gorilla says, wait, is Cuck rem- uh, considered a square? Uh, a square? A square? Um, yes. No. Is it a square? No. <laughs> well, yeah, no, a Cuck would be a square. So, yeah. <laughs> Damn. Franco Walker says, uh, put her down, Kirk. You don't know where she's been. Mm. Well, that's interesting, just because she is sort of that, she is somewhat virginal in her uh presentation she's innocent and yet worldly at the same time and yep. so i find that irresistible oh sorry sorry so did kirk so did kirk <laughs> i am kirk no <laughs> kirok kirok yeah where's that Come i on. am kirok there we go <laughs> indeed Classic Comics says, uh, in Kirk's class, you either think or, or sink. sink. Gary yep. Mitchell from Where No Man Has Gone Before. Exactly. True story. Oh. 
and classic comics he's he's uh the phantom of the paradise is his his uh avatar delightful franco walker says uh i thought he said he was moses my bad no he, he met moses he yeah met. he uh, great uh, spock was referring to you must have met the greatest minds or something like that and he rattles off a whole bunch including socrates and moses so it's like okay you know moses so you were pretending to be uh, a you know of the jewish no. tribe uh wandering for 40 years in the desert or what you no, know it was before that it was before that because he was like hey mo check out that burning bush no that's uh that is that how it goes it. no that's, that's not how it goes not how it goes Gorilla's Random Thought says, uh, for a pacifist, he apparently was the greatest general the world ever saw. And I think it is a matter of guilt that uh, that Flint responds the way he does. Not only is he immortal, but he wants to get away from humanity so that he, he, want, he doesn't want to have humanity's uh, cruelty inflicted upon himself. But I think that he also is avoiding inflicting his cruelty upon anyone else. I find Flint a fascinating character. Yeah, but it's, uh, it's just basically when did he actually leave the Earth? Because it would have to be still full of strife. But it's like, well, wait a minute. How long has he been in outer space? And how did he get way out here? And I have a lot of questions about it's like, uh, you know, because we all know uh, in the 23rd century, Earth is a utopia. Yes, you know, but so it's like, when did he leave Earth? Because he probably had to leave. Well, you know, they don't. If, if they don't specify when, it's like, well, how? You know, I don't know. I have a lot of questions. Well, those are good questions. Yeah. Well, but also, like Zephram Cochran is the creator of the warp drive, unless uh, Flint discovered it before Zephram Cochran. Uh, yeah, that, that would also, be. Yeah, we wow. also know the dinosaurs discovered warp dinosaurs. drive. Well, di <laughs> those were dinosaurs, so that's a different species. So we're okay. that was millions of years ago, so we don't have to worry about that. Yeah, ancient yeah, astronauts were dinosaurs. Yeah, that was exactly. uh, that was it. That's an interesting theory that it's like we know about Zephyr from Cochrane, but maybe <laughs> Flint was, was the actual one that invented it and kept it to himself. And when we and 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 fooled the Vulcans and didn't, you know, show up on their sensors well, and we <laughs> when got, he left the Earth. <laughs> we got Apollo as well. So like ancient gods were uh, were were aliens as well. So in terms of the timeline, I kind of let it slide based on all of the ridiculousness that we've seen so far in yeah. the first three seasons of this television show. True, a lot can be forgiven, and if this guy wants to be. Uh, uh, one of the Ninja Turtles. That's fine with me. <laughs> well, but guess okay. So if anybody was wondering what the dinosaurs were about, you got to watch Star Trek Voyager. And you don't gotta. To, you got well. You know what? Just watch that one episode. Oh wait, 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 wait. It's really, I would really like good. to say while you brought up while you brought up Voyager, I just want to say that uh, that Catherine Janeway in the episode concerning flight says, mm -hmm. you know what? Jim Kirk once claimed to meet Leonardo da Vinci. And she scoffs it off. But the thing is, he did. As, yeah. And I love the fact that Voyager references this episode. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Oh, yeah. That, that was the episode with Sulu, wasn't it? No, that was well, flashback. That, that kind of brings flashback. Back problems. Flashback had Sulu. Yeah. yeah no, the episode in question is called Concerning Flight. Concerning Flight. Oh, okay. And you're oh. right, Bird. What were you going to say? Uh, yeah, the confused. fact that Excuse me. he remembers this at all now kind of confuses me as to exactly what the point of the last words. I don't I don't think it's about the entire mission because he would have been yeah, Captain's Law. It's about, I think it's, it's, it's yeah. Reyna. Uh, I guess. Yeah, it's Reyna. Mm -hmm. So he just remembers uh, Flint and the Ritalin and some difficulty with that, and that's all he remembers. That's my head cannon, anyway. <laughs> I'm fine with that. I'm totally fine with that. Uh, Gavin Blackburn, hello, Gavin. 
I'm sure I said hello before, but uh, I forget things, much like Captain Kirk under the guy, under yeah. the influence of Spock. Well, yeah, Gavin has been here, and but I haven't got, gotten to say hello to He says, uh, Nicole Williamson was my favorite Merlin from Excalibur. That's a wonderful performance, but the thing is, Nicole yes. Williamson continued to do the sing-song thing when he did Macbeth for the BBC, and it drove me and my father nuts when we were watching that. It's like don't do don't do Merlin don't do the Merlin sing song and he did as Macbeth. Yeah, but as, but as Merlin in Excalibur, he's just wonderful. I have to I, go. He and is. See. I do like Excalibur. Yeah, Me it's too. a lot of fun. I really want to see uh, Spawn, the the comic book adaptation because it has Nicole Williamson in it as well. So this <laughs> is the thing that I heard about recently, and I was wondering if it was the same model. And Gavin Blackburn is saying it is the three foot model is the one that turned up last year after being lost for 30 years. And I heard yeah. about that yep. story and I didn't yep. know if this was the same model. Yeah, I think the very same one. Yeah, I think so. And also uh, it's because of those darn Lucasfilm people that stole it when they did, you know, the, uh... no, wait a minute. I take that back. It was uh, FX general. It was uh, Trumbull's effects group that worked with that model when they made the uh the refit for motion picture so, so you think some, they stole this somebody somebody at effects general which is douglas trumbull's company that did the special effects for the motion picture somebody there stole it yeah because roddenberry w wrote them several letters saying hey you know could you bring could you send back my the enterprise model because that was on his desk for a number of years and they were like, uh, no. And oh, and they never did. They never did. And then it just turned up like Gavin Blackburn said. Yeah, it just turned up. I'm so glad that it did turn up because yeah. it was lost forever. Nobody had any clue where and it was. And it's going back to and... Roddenberry's son, uh, if I remember oh, correctly. Well, that's that's good news. It should go back to the family for sure. Yep. And so it was, yeah, it, it just showed up on eBay one day. And here we are. It so was someone... found. It was found in a storage locker somewhere. I think it might have been Ohio. I'm not too sure. That's what I heard. Well, uh -huh. I want to say hello to words and pictures. Just to keep hey. the chat going while Jill is away, Leonardo da Vinci creating a woman <laughs> may be problematic as Mona Lisa is likely to be Gian, Gian Giacomo Caprotti. His young male protege. Just saying. I'm a, I'm a cis white dude, so I like my heteronormative history. So I don't care what you say, words and pictures. But thank you for your input. Yeah, I, I don't know what I'd... There's people a lot of... love to say the Mona Lisa is something that it's not. Yeah, there's a lot of weird theories, you know. And uh, I, I'm going to go with, uh, with uh, the Hudson Hawk theory. <laughs> yeah, me too, yo. <laughs> Oh, she's got bad teeth. I do appreciate your you bringing your theories here, though. Words and pictures is so yes, great. absolutely, absolutely. And Franco Walker says another theory is that the Mona Lisa is a self portrait with him wearing a dress. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the first wacko theory that. Oh, excuse me, different theory that I heard back in the day. But yeah, it was like it's actually himself. And was he like, Napoleon too? <laughs> I don't know. Like, and that's the thing. Yeah, it's it, yeah, crazy. it's like where where do you stop? It's like who wasn't he? You know, it's like <laughs> but, yeah, I, I would have started with the four generals of Alexander. He was Andy Kaufman. Yeah, Jeez. yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> well, no, but that's the thing is that we're just supposed to accept him as being loose. Like, and I think that's part of the story. Yeah, I think that's part of what the what this is about is that we're supposed to be Cap Captain Kirk and Flint. Flint is the superior man who created Reyna. And then Kirk shows up. Reyna prefers Kirk. And we are supposed to match up Flint and Kirk and say, which one should Reyna go with? And the th how do you diminish Kirk? By making Flint the superior man in every iteration. And when Reyna has the opportunity to choose for herself, she says, I won't, I will not be a pawn in your affections. And I think that's what this story is about. 
Like, and well, yeah, as you she was she wasn't she wasn't going to let Flint keep the Enterprise as a toy on the desk for two thousand years. Right. Right. Well, she wasn't willing to be. She wasn't going to uh, allow uh, sort of suspended animation to happen to innocent people based on her existence as a put or a tug of war between warring love and which brings me to the other comparison to and i don't know if i already said this if i'm repeating myself please tell me lol this is oh this you is, were gonna yes no like you this, haven't said it but that's in my final review of this episode it's part of why i i, I still love it Oh, so I got there. Yay. But like this is this is where Lol or sorry, Reina finally discovers her own emotions. They are overwhelming. She doesn't know what to do with them, even though that she was created to feel them. And she says, Well, then I choose. And she can't make the choice because her programming won't allow it. It's heartbreaking literally yeah i think that's uh where her performance succeeds uh it kind of papers over the cracks uh in the execution in this episode well there's one more chasm to come <laughs> okay <laughs> in my opinion i could be wrong yeah the men are gonna fight they're gonna tussle they're gonna they fight. Fight. They fight. Fight. They fight. They fight. They fight. They fight. <laughs> fight. 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 The fight, Kirk fight. and Flint show. No. Yay! <laughs> and as Krusty would say to their, you know, Eastern Bloc comparison, the hell was that? <laughs> this is very, I don't know, clumsy. Also, what the hell, guys? Sorry, what the cuss, guys? We got we got McCoy and Spock just sort of standing there, and it's like, nah, let them fight. It'll be fine. Let them fight. Like, why are McCoy and Spock not even helping? Worst wingmen ever. This is where we could use the Vulcan neck pinch. Of course, Flint's probably immune to it. But... Well, and apparently, like... Yeah, but he on... should try. Yeah, yeah giving try. it a go would have been a nice, nice effort. Yeah. <laughs> Like this the is only almost... thing that actually stops them is Raina. Yep. Yeah. As it as it should be. We're fighting over a woman. No, you're not. Thanks, Spock. Thanks, McCoy, Spock. McCoy, meanwhile, is just gaping. Another clip I would have had was, I cannot be the cause of this. I will not be the cause of this. Please stop. Stop. I choose where I want to go. What and I want to do, I choose. I choose. Yeah. And the acting is brilliant. Like she cries on her own. Like this is, I think that this is a yeah. really, really great performance. Yep. I agree. And she, she uh, admitted in the Cushman book that she didn't really know what she was going to do, what she was supposed to do, but she just went with her instinct. And I go, yep. It's a really good performance. Excellent. Also, big shout out to William Tice and the costume design. Yeah, uh, Louise referred to it as a fancy band aid. Yeah, they just kind of they just kind of wrapped her real quick with, but it. I think it's cool. It's. it's I think it's both yeah. ele elegant and titillating. I think it's, it's just, nice. Yeah, it's just yeah, metallic, like kind of the same thing with Flint. It's kind of metallic, kind of sheen to their costumes, and it's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. I will feel it for both of us. Yeah. Uh, yeah. She's just, you can see that she's tearing up and it's like, oh boy. Oh, she rolls a tear. She's oh, doing something. yeah. Like the she's... performance and the characterization is great. This faint, not so good. Well, you know, hey, you the don't want, her, have everything. You don't want her to hurt herself. She's, yes. you know, it's not a stunt it's... double. So, <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a hard floor, it's... you know. <laughs> it's just powers I think it's done down. Better in the offspring. What was that? I I think it's done better in the offspring in terms of the emotion and the drama of the manner. 
is a lot better. But the idea is here. And I do love the idea. And Spock says, she loved you, Captain, and you too, Mr. Flint. As a mentor, even as a father, there was not enough time for her to adjust to the awful power and contradictions of her newfound emotions. She could not bear to hurt either of you. The joys of love made her human, and the agonies of love destroyed her. And, oh, and that's that's the, almost the episode. No, this is the worst Except part. For, hey, the part where, welcome to the jungle. What, why is Kirk so lovelorn? Like, I, it was just lust. He, I don't really think he was in love, but I guess he was in love because now he's just, like, having his head on the desk. He can't... And so he's, Spock he's, is so yeah, he's heartbroken. So taken with his friend's pain that he decides to mind meld his pain away. Which is I need I, my pain. No, I've yeah, exactly. Well, we talked about that. Jill and I talked about that. Yeah. Um, but I think that this is a a, a situation. Oh wait, we have to we have to address what's going to happen to Flint. As uh, through the report of Dr. McCoy. Right, because, he's going to eventually die. Because he left, he left Earth 30 years ago, apparently. And now, because of all of the things that made him immortal on Earth, are not present on uh, Gormenghast 17. Uh, and so he's going to die. He's no, no longer it, immortal. It's, it's not that well, he left. He it's, not, it's not okay. that he left Earth. 30 years ago is that he purchased this particular planet. So he may have been planet hopping for centuries. But McCoy well, says think, he seemed like it would be a surprise to him that he was going to die soon. And by soon, I mean 30 to 50, yeah, 100 years, you know. Who knows? Um, yeah. But with because that, yeah. he thought that he was going to keep the enterprise for 2,000 years. Yes. Mm -hmm. Earlier in the episode. Now, at best, he'd have maybe, you know, 50 years. Right. Mm -hmm. It just and seemed like he should have been more surprised. He should be more surprised. Yeah, agreed completely. Yeah, well, we don't see any of this. This is all. No. Right. This is but, all off screen. This is all afterwards. What, of course, what's he going to do with the years that he has left? Uh, contribute to the human condition is yep. what he said. Yep, that's what IRS says. those other androids two at a time is what I suspect. <laughs> two at a time? <laughs> uh, he's might as well. He, he's not going to have a whole lot of time left. Um, well, immortality gets quite boring. Well, I guess that's all. Well, no, no, we, we so uh, McCoy informs Spock of that and then admonishes him for not understanding love and the, the pain, the agony and the ecstasy of love. And so McCoy says, anyway, I'm going, I'm leaving. And Spock says, okay. And then he decides to excise the memory of an individual from his friend's brain. And it's like, yeah, that's kind of an assault on me, Spark. I know it's meant with the best intentions, but I think you're actually, you're kind of messing with my life, which can um, be further, further identified when uh, Star Trek V rolls around and he says, I need my pain. Yeah, precisely what I thought of too. So I think that this is weird and creepy. I think it is with the best intentions. I think it's out of character. I think Spock is being overly emotional. Uh, I think that uh, Kirk was taken under the thrall of Reyna, but I think Kirk, uh, or sorry, Spock overstepped his bounds. I think uh, so too. He should have gotten consent for something like this. Who wants yeah. to actually excise memory and what kind of damage will that do to the other cascading memories that are surrounding it he's just gonna forget this how's he gonna write a starfleet start his report and kirk no, never he's... played billiards again he uh <laughs> the the memory of reyna will be excised only he'll mm -hmm. still be able to do a report on whatever he wants to i don't know how much he can 
he wants to reveal about Flint, but uh, he he'll still be able to do his captain's log or his. Oh, report. that's right. He's supposed to be quiet about, Flint. but Flint's going to so, die anyway, so it doesn't matter now. So. So he just has to wait 30 years. Yeah, I, you know, after McCoy saying, you know, Spock, you don't understand that. You'll never know this and all that. And then he does this. It's obviously he cares about Kirk. And so I, I don't, I don't have a problem with this, but I I, think I can understand uh, Scotty, you you and Jill having a bit of a problem. I mean, you articulated, you know, what, what you're having issues with. And I, I understand that. Thanks. I just for for me personally, I I found that little touching, you know, uh, that Spock cared enough for Kirk. Uh, you know, it's kind of a an answer to McCoy. And when McCoy, of course, walks out, he doesn't witness this. But the thing is, it's there's a little more to Spock than what McCoy suspects. <laughs> yes, he's a mind eraser. That makes things very strange for me. Also, and I would. Yeah. But as a benefit, I would like to say that I enjoy the fact that he says forget in this, and then at the end of Star Trek 2, he says remember. Remember. Yes, and but Stone Racket is saying that Spock does this out of compassion. But I uh-huh. yeah. this 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 kind of thing, you gotta you gotta ask for permission. Yeah. Dr. McCoy, okay, so this is from the 365 book. Dr. McCoy often needles Mr. Spock about his lack of emotions, a criticism the Vulcan usually ignores. In the closing scene of Requiem for Methuselah, after McCoy lectures Spock about his inability to comprehend love, he remarks almost as an aside that he wishes the grieving Kirk could forget about the lovely android Reina. After McCoy departs, Spock approaches the slumbering captain, places his fingers at Kirk's temple, and murmurs just one word, forget. Bands immediately understand two things, that Spock has implanted a subconscious instruction telling Kirk to forget the pain of loving and losing Rena, and also that Spock understands at least one kind of love, brotherly love. It's an intriguing moment, one that neatly parallels Spock smelled with McCoy at the end of Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, when he instructs the Doctor to remember. It is only the subsequent film, Star Trek III, the search for Spock that viewers learn Spock has placed his own Katra or living spirit into his friend McCoy's subconscious for safekeeping. Yet as touching as these scenes are, there's something slightly off about both moments. Is it ethical for Spock to impose his Katra on the doctor without asking? Similarly, is it right for Spock to manipulate Kirk's memories in order to ease his best friend's pain? One suspects that Kirk would say no, given that, as he later insists in the film Star Trek V, The Final Frontier. I need my pain. Ironically, both acts serve to prove one thing. Spock is definitely capable of comprehending and falling subject to the broken rules and the desperate chances of love. So so anyway, the plague was cured. And <laughs> so more anyway, back everybody, at the ranch. everybody got their shots, <laughs> and we can head uh, go. You know, ahead warp factor two. Okay, so <laughs> guys, I I want to get your reviews from the panel, and then we will head back to the chat and see what's going on there after after we get our reviews. So let's see. Oh, there was something interesting in the credits. Hold on. Oh, that's the remastered Reina. James Daly as Flint. Oh, they. Louisa. Yeah, they, oh, they fixed it. Yeah, they yeah. fixed it in the remastered because it was Rena or something like that, right? They misspelled Reina in the credits in the original well, series. Well, at least they spelled Louise's name correctly. <laughs> Louise Sorrel, yeah, and they did yeah, get. Louise that's Sor- the most important part is yeah. Louise Sorrel, right? <laughs> but I think that was it. And I don't know who else is here. Did I miss anybody? No, I don't even think. No, no that's it. That's it. Hey, there's Spock's brain. Brain and yep. brain. What is brain? <laughs> yeah, and there's Arthur Singer's name over brain. Brain. What is brain? <laughs> <laughs> Story <laughs> consultant. Funny. You keep screwing up my scripts, says Jerome Bixby. <laughs> he did. I I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a tiebreaker. 
Yeah, Fry Burger Brain. No post credit scene, says Tim's talk. Hi, Tim. <laughs> hey, Tim. Oh, he also says this. Tim's talk says this. Oh, this is actually here. Risk is our business. Indeed. What? The starship. Why do you why do you keep making the Apollo 13 tumble around? I'm trying oh. to. Oh, I'm sorry. You know what happened oh, to the Enterprise? Yeah. <laughs> there we go. It, whenever we change, it, I had my Apollo 13 stream last week, and so all of my all of my folders have Apollo 13 in the corner. So if I go to any other, if that's where it, I so I gotta oh. fix each and every one. So I will fix that while you give me your review of this episode, Scotty R37, please. Uh, I'm going to give it a B. Uh, I was really anticipating hating this because I I remember it from a long time ago as it being boring. But I enjoy the romance of it. And I sort of accept Raina as being an idealized woman. And her affection towards Kirk uh, was reciprocated. And so the romance, while quick, I, I absolutely... Uh, concede that point um i do think that everything sort of works for me uh moving over from last week's uh herbert episode is herbert. i don't i don't like the, how it does come to a complete stop every time there's a musical <laughs> interlude that brings it down and then the intrusive telepathic assault at the end in Kirk's quarters, I am also like, uh, I can kind of forgive it because it seems like a nice thing to do, but uh, I can't, I can't completely forgive it. So I'm giving it a B. It, it's it, I will, I will watch this episode again uh, because I think it all, I think it's romantic. I think it's tragically romantic, and so, and it reminds me of Lol. It reminds me of Kam uh, Kamala. Uh, it reminds me of Next Generation issues, and I think it's completely in fitting with these characters. Uh, I just also think that it's one of those situations where if you want to blame anything on anybody, it's because they're feverish. So B, you know I reach you. <laughs> we reach, brother. Can. <laughs> Okay, that was great, and and even though I kind of disagree a bit with how you how uh, Kirk is portrayed, I I do mostly agree with that. Actually, I'm, I'm a bit surprised. Bird of Prey five. Well, how do you yeah. rate this episode? Not like all TOS episodes, it is definitely an A. Damn right it is. <laughs> I don't know. How However, many uh, I would say so. Just. Just a solid A. Um, I uh, also, as a toxic male, I quite enjoy seeing Captain Kirk uh, meet new and uh, strange uh, space women every week and uh, finding reasons to uh, fall in love with them. And uh, even to the point that we maybe feel bad for him when he doesn't end up getting getting the girl. And, well, it's always sad when the girl has to die. Uh, I don't really know why she had to die this time. Uh, I guess just so that Captain Kirk didn't have uh, a reason to take her with him. Uh, but... Uh, Whatever. Uh, gotta be sacrifices. So be it. No, in all honesty, um, I was a little weirded out. Uh, it, it just didn't seem it just didn't seem right this week. Uh, well, yeah, those aren't Kirk's moves. They're, yeah. they're somebody else's. Yeah. Um, but still, uh, it's a much better it's a much better episode than anything we got now. So it's uh, still a good episode to me. 
And I think it's worth watching. So, solid A. Very good. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bird Prey 5, for showing up here and giving us your perspective. It's no worries. I mean, I really didn't give much perspective at all. Well, well when you did, it was good. I, I, I liked learning about that that uh, observatory. So, Jim or Captain Duke Shepard, what do you rate this episode? Oh, I'll give it a big fat A, just like Bird. Th thumbs up all the way. Uh, I think this was a Valentine's Day episode. You know, love and, of course, you lose a girl and everything. The program just couldn't handle it. And, of course, Kirk did want to try to forget, and Spock helped him out, you know, as a gesture or as loving the captain so he wouldn't feel the hurt down the road so he could keep doing his role as a captain of the enterprise. And that's my report. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> captain Duke Shepard. You're welcome. Except he doesn't, Kirk never says, I want to forget. Spock assumes he wants to forget and McCoy assumes he wants to forget. So if Kirk had said that, then we, I wouldn't have had an issue with the, the mind meld. Pop culture curator, how do you rate this one? I would give it a B plus. I did enjoy it. Um, I, I guess it did feel a little forced that Kirk always has to have a love affair with somebody, and but it, I guess this one was taken a little more serious than others, which I can appreciate. And I agree that I don't know if it was right that Spock gave him the medal without the permission. And I guess couldn't Flint always build another one of her once Kirk's gone? Who knows? Yeah. But I enjoyed it. It was a solid episode for the third season. It was good. I, I, I appreciate it. And uh, I have nothing but fond memories of it. And thank you for having me on here, Jill. You're welcome. Uh, I think Bird was saying that next time he's just going to build two of them. Yeah, and... just build another one. Yeah, so Stone Rack, Stone Rack, how do you rate this episode? I uh, gave this episode a B. Uh, it's uh, one of my top ten favorite uh, episodes from the third season. Uh, I enjoyed this uh, episode uh, when I first saw it as a child, uh, and I've always liked it. Um, <laughs> and. Uh, I am not sure what the objection is from the dogs there, from the captain, but <laughs> I'm I, sorry. Uh, These no, dogs bark at anything. That's no, that's that's fine. I understand. But uh yeah, I uh enjoyed uh, the two guest stars very much. Um and I think uh, like I said that their performances help me uh in uh overcoming uh, the problematic uh execution. Because there are things, you know, all of you have brought up, uh, you know, things that uh, you have problems with. And I, I totally see where you're coming from. But for me, I'm a little more forgiving. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I I really like uh, Louise Sorrell. Uh, and I liked her interaction with uh, Captain Kirk. Um, so I didn't have a, I didn't really have a big problem with the love story, but um, again, I'm a little too forgiving, I think, uh, of that. And the ending, uh, I totally agree with uh, if if Kirk had just said something like, I wish I could just forget this, or instead of having uh, McCoy say that, even though McCoy knows uh, Jim very, very well, it still would, would have been better having it said by Captain Kirk, and then Spock's mind meld would have gone down a lot a lot better. I, I totally agree with that. But I still find the ending touching in a way. Uh, and, uh, you know, Spock uh, does feel for his captain and uh, wants to do uh, the right thing by him. Yep. And uh, so that he can go on being the best captain in the Starfleet. But uh, yeah, I, uh, I gave this one a B. 
Be all right. Well, I did kind of have an issue with Kirk and and Raina. Their romance. Your 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 explanation of why you believe in it is is a uh, important to me, but it still doesn't work for me. I still don't see it. I still don't see their romance as making much of any sense. He, Kirk was inexplicably in love without any reason. But still, I do give this a B minus because um, uh, for a lot of reasons. But this one part of the thing, I, I don't like it because this this kind of episode plays into that myth that people say that Kirk is a womanizer. And I think that that myth only really comes from these later season three episodes. In seasons one and two, he either woos someone because he's trying to save the Enterprise or he's meeting up with an old girlfriend or he found his soulmate when he found Edith Keeler. And in season three, he was in love with Miramani because he forgot who he was. And so that romance was able to develop. But here, I'm not really given any reason to get into this love to believe that there's love here any more than just lust. Like uh, Bird was saying, um, the Linda is just trying to get Raina to learn how to make love. <laughs> I don't know if it's actually to love because I didn't get love out of it. And so that's, that's my biggest issue with it. And, and I don't think that Kirk would forget his dying crew and just fall in love without a reason and keep pursuing this when his crew is dying. Like That's this. true. Yeah. And it, it, but I also agree that it seems odd that Spock would mind meld and alter memory without consent. However, his presence otherwise in this episode is what saves this episode in large part for me due to how fascinated he was with his surroundings and how suspicious he was of the true nature of the creations that captivated him. So Spock gets to nerd out, and he should because it's his birthday. So no matter what, what I what I would would have rated this on another day, I can't go lower than a B minus. So that's why that's part of why I give it a B minus. But also, the idea of Flint is really cool, as is the android Reina and the tragedy of how he could never get. Was what was supposed to be his perfect mate to ever love him back, and and uh, the the reason the number one reason why I give this a B minus besides that not uh, the his, it being his birthday was just a joke really, the real reason is something Scotty already mentioned. I have no proof of this, but this episode obviously reminds me of my absolute favorite episode of the next generation so it does remind me of the offspring as well and lol only survived for 50 or so days and in that time developed emotion as a natural step in her programming but of course it turned out to be too much for her and so that's why after this episode lol only exists in data's memory in a similar way the love that reina developed also ended up overloading and destroying her so even though I didn't really buy into the love, I love the idea of an android overclocking, overloading, whatever happened to her due to not being able to process feelings. And that's a kind of story that really does get to me. And the, the, the drama for me is better done in the next generation. But it's interesting to wonder if the notion began here. Did, did the author of this episode watch this one and get inspiration from it? And if so, then this episode probably earns even more than a B minus, but I don't know for sure. But for potentially inspiring my favorite TNG episode, definitely at least a B minus. Yeah, I, I agree. I think uh, it did inspire the writer of, of that episode of TNG. I think for there's two a, episodes. Or for two episodes, yeah. But Jill, uh, you know, you're you're just you're you're not a toxic male and you just can't see the love story working in requiem for methuselah no, i think that's talking, my problem no i talk to females she talks no about no no dudes all the time no i i find your your perspective uh i i just i i like uh hearing all all of what you've said about it because i 
like I said, I'm biased when I look at it because uh, I'm a toxic male too, uh, like Kirk. No, uh, I mean. <laughs> well, I could see how one would love her. She is gorgeous and intelligent, and I do but, see that. I do see but, the potential yeah, of it's more, talking it's, to her. It's more than that. She's just so charming. Or the performance by Louise Sorrell. She's just so charming in this episode. But the problem I, is that she doesn't seem like she's interested in a romance. She seems like she's kind of nervous and she's kind of unsure of herself. And there's no, there's the connection doesn't connect with me. That it, that but, it seems more like she doesn't. But want she's to be uh, she's with Kirk. She's with the Kirk. Of course, everything will work out. <laughs> Yeah. No, it's not up, actually, it's not up to you. It's up to it's up to Reina. And it's up to Reina. That's right. I choose. Yeah, it is uh, up to Reina. I, I love that True. moment. I, love I do. That. I do too. That is to, a good. To be, that is a good. To line. be totally honest, uh, I, I love that moment. But well, it doesn't matter if go. it's not up to me. It is my opinion. Oh, hey. If you've got to go, Scotty or 37, you've got to tell us what you're doing around here on the internet and where we can find you and what you want to, anything else you want to add before you get out of here. I also have to leave within the next 15 minutes, but I will allow you to depart. Uh, uh, permission to disembark, Captain. Yes. Thank you. You may. Bye, Scotty. Uh, but it's it's a it's a fantastic. Uh, this has been so uh, awesome just to be able to hang out with you guys and talk about a little dis, uh, a, a, a little discussed episode. And so this is really fun. Um, I am Scotty R thirty seven on the Twitter, the X, the what have yous, uh, and on the Phantasmagorium show. Me and my friend Cat are talking about. Uh, the Fargo seasons. We're going to be talking about something different once we finish up with Fargo season three, but we are on episode seven and eight this Thursday. We're uh, going to do that. And then uh, I'm, I'm planning on having a good Friday and I'll probably end up watching RoboCop, but I don't know where that's going to happen. Maybe just on my lonesome, you know, for my own personal re education but thank you so much for having me here. You guys are awesome on the panel and everybody in the chat is such a pleasure uh to to just be able to hang out and talk about star trek so thank you yes thank take you care, thank you so scotty. much buddy. yeah take um, care scotty let's go take I'll care and see you, say Jim. say hi to your mom for all of us please yeah oh that sounds dirtier than it should but i will <laughs> no 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 <laughs> what no i'll I've... see you soon bird couple uh, he, yeah he didn't mean that no no calm down it's fine it's just jokes it's my mom i'm allowed to say whatever i want i'll see you in the future of course okay. see you soon scotty see you can't in the wait future. to see you again thank you so much for being here you are the color and the light of this channel and i'm just happy you're here and i'm also happy all of you guys are here also and so I want to, I want to, well, since everybody gave their review, now I can show the poll. The poll is right here. And so the poll, people overwhelmingly give this episode a B, B range of, of this episode. So did um, half the panel and two. So actually it kind of matched the panel's results almost. Yeah, mm -hmm. where most of us gave it a B and a couple of us gave it an A. Yeah. So 34% gave an A, 52% a B, 10% C, and 3% went for a D. In a, oh, my goodness. Interesting. Wow. Well, A, uh, IDIC. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everybody's opinion. Yep. A, B, C, D. It's all the same. Mm -hmm. Back to school. <laughs> So I'm gonna do a bit. Uh, I'm gonna do a bit of uh, cat a chat catch up and see what I catch see, up. See what I missed up missed out on mustard. Anybody get mustard? Mustard. Oh, catch up. Catch up mustard. <laughs> anybody? Anybody put catch? If you're interested, yeah, uh, Jill, I did just throw up the picture uh, of that house with the observatory in Sedona as it was. Wow. In 2003. It's uh, oh, oh, gotcha. And StreamYard, here it is. Oh, that's oh, nice. Wow. I like that. That is Flint's house. <laughs> <laughs> Trailer and all, huh? 
Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, well, it's, it's still that it's, was still being built. At the yeah, time. it's still being yeah. built, and but, uh, uh, so unfortunately, now that it's really built, the observatory is gone. Right in the center. It was nice when it lasted. Yeah, it's been awesome. Oh my gosh! Yeah, and that's beautiful. Something else that's beautiful just happened in the chat. Words and pictures. I was just so excited that you were here. I didn't expect you to also give oh, me cool. a present. Thank you so much. Words and pictures just gifted five antiderivative Jill memberships. And who received those memberships? Oh, let's find out. That's Not the me. exciting part. Well, <laughs> Jeff B became a sponsor. Damn it. Radioactive <laughs> became just became a sponsor. Radioactive. Yeah. Keith, Keith E. e. Keith E. Keith E is awesome. Cam Cam also awesome. Awesome. Oh, Cam Cam. God love Cam Cam. Congratulations to everybody who won a a uh, membership to my channel. Sweet. I have I have membership streams on the first Wednesday of every month. So that'll be April 3rd. Let's see what we get up to on April 3rd. You never know what's going to happen on the membership streams. And uh, DJ Play Nice says it was part of their contract writers, so promoters will be sure to read and provide for all things, including if a venue didn't provide the correct stuff, they breached contract and had to pay money. Oh, I must be missing context to that, and which is why I was actually going to read the chat, but I got I got distracted by presents. <laughs> that would do it. Pretty oh, presents. Well. Yeah. In the chat. <laughs> okay, so where was I in the, in the chat? No one is ever going to get that esoteric link. Uh, words and pictures says to. Oh, which I one? Know. I don't know. Yes. <laughs> oh, oh, the Mona Lisa stuff. The Mona oh, Lisa the Mona series. Lisa. Oh, okay, no gotcha. Series. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Clinton was a cabbie in 1994. <laughs> yeah, right. He got tired of only being legendary people. Yeah. Every once in a while, he was just a normal guy. Just a normal guy. <laughs> yeah. It's like, you know, claiming to be Methuselah, an anti-Diluvian patriarch. It's like, okay, so which son of Noah was he? <laughs> it's like, going to go back that far. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, that's dragons. quite problematic. Science fiction diagnostic capabilities are pretty cool. Indeed. Yeah, I think I agree with that. Yes. Oh, I did get a free membership at your channel. I just got you the notification. Did. Hooray. I don't know how Ooh. that happened. Yeah, that happened um, way back at the beginning of the stream. A whole bunch of people got free memberships, hmm. but I don't know well, how because it didn't, it didn't say who sent them. Yeah. Well, it just, it was, I thought, donor. I thought that was just, uh, the automatic renewal. No, event. but it said that Jim got a membership, didn't it? Mm -hmm. um, I have to go back and play. It. I thought it was just, uh, it, actually, you know, that just the stream elements was just saying so-and-so is a sponsor, but it was just because their, their, uh, membership was renewed. That's what I assumed because it didn't say that somebody gifted. Cause yeah. I, I, I can't receive gift memberships because, mm -hmm. uh, me they, what what what's called a branded account? Really? Yeah, branded too. But wow. I gotta get through this chat. Yeah, I got, I got two minutes to do it. I can still hear the ticking of the hideous clock he swallowed. Says Edge Time. What are they talking about? <laughs> no Captain idea. Hook. Captain, Captain Hook, uh, the alligator. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> The woman I built had a mop for a head, says James. Oh, you built no. a woman? James Casilda built a woman with a mop on. I think he's making fun of Louise's uh, blonde wig. <laughs> oh, that might make more sense. That James uh -oh. Caserta, that he's, he's making me mad. Warm going off. It's been disabled. Mm -hmm. Oh, he can't remember the name of the woman he built. So he really did build a woman with a mop for a head. Oh, <laughs> Oh of course, God. I think I think of Herman Munster and his, uh, you know, trying to trick Lily when he puts a, a pail and a mop, uh, to, you know, when he's sneaking out with Grandpa to do uh, 
whatever, trying to correct whatever kerfuffle it got into. <laughs> and Lily yeah. just, she's like, she, she feels the, the pail and the, and the mop for hair and she's okay with it. And then later she discovers that, wait a minute, this isn't Herman. <laughs> Well, I did that to my mom one time in terms of um, I put a, a giant I got a giant doll for Christmas and I put it next to the bed and she was like, oh, you want me to comb your hair? And she was combing the doll's hair thinking it was me. <laughs> and she woke up screaming. I didn't oh, know dear. That was happen. Oh, dear. Your mom woke up screaming. Oh, dear. Yeah. So I was like, I was like six or something. I didn't, I didn't realize I was going to terrify her. I didn't want, yeah, I didn't so want the an, prank to go that an, way. An innocent mistake. Hopefully you didn't get a spanking for that. No, no, no. My mom didn't. Good. Luckily, Franco Walker says, "I just watched that end scene." Kirk says, "If only I could forget." Really? Oh, he, oh, he does say that. Does he? Oh my goodness! Franco Walker to the rescue. Oh, hey, hey, Scotty! Guess what? Our whole our whole review is thrown asunder. Kirk says, a I, I don't know how I missed that. I am so sorry. A very old and lonely man and a young and lonely man. We put on a poor show, didn't we? If only I, I could, could forget. forget. Yep, I'm he reading the transcript too. He's specifically asking to forget. But I guess maybe, maybe I mean, he didn't uh, ask. Spock, can you use your super Vulcan powers to yeah, set but my memory? That, but that, but that, that, helps. Solves, that helps. That solves everything for me. Yeah, that really does help that, me too. Yeah, I, I'm shocked I forgot that. I, I forgot it too. Well, we all did. So I guess I don't feel as bad. And I'm grateful for Franco Walker. You saved the yep. validity <clears throat> of this entire live stream by reminding yep. us of that fact. Franco to the rescue rescue. Yes. We got to we got to let Scotty know. We got to update This live him. stream <laughs> this live stream is dedicated to the awesomeness of Franco Walker's diligence. Yes. Um reticent to say as it's behind the fourth wall views were needed for season 3 and this is the studio decision episode. 55 years ago, 69, attempting to appeal to the audience at the time. You're exactly right. Words and pictures. This was the point in the series where it was just completely network driven and they were telling Freiberger, make more women watch the show and do things. More lovey dovey. More, yeah, yeah, yeah. Less less action and adventure, more kissing and stuff. I don't know. I have no clue what was going on through the network's head. But this wasn't this this still managed to have some science fiction in this episode, and it's why I still like it. Yep, courtesy of Jerome Bixby. Yeah. Yeah, and so the networks couldn't kill Jerome Bixby's episode as much as they wanted to. They tried. But uh, Jerome Bixby needed a good school field study Bible. <laughs> mm -hmm. oh, so did so did the showrunner and the script. Yeah, everybody. <laughs> the script It's like, uh, yeah, let's uh, let's keep the uh, Old Testament out of this. Well, okay? yeah, it's just because we don't have our our two genes, our Dorothy. It's like Dorothy, way Dorothy too Fontana's problematic. Yeah. Birthday was yesterday. By the oh, way. Dorothy Fontana. Yeah. Oh, sweet, sweet. Mm -hmm. They say Van Halen would only eat the brown. Oh, M and M's. M &Ms. <laughs> the M and M's. <laughs> wow. And so everybody becomes a sponsor. That was cool. And uh, my messenger is messaging me. I gotta close it, or else I'll be distracted. And that's it. We got through the chat too. Now I gotta get the heck out of here. Yeah. Thank you, Jill as always, mm -hmm. for your Star Trek streams and for having all You're of us welcome. on your panel. It's always uh, great to talk to you about Star Trek and uh, uh, yeah. cl classic Star Trek at that. Yes, thank yeah. you, Stone Racket. Anything else you want to share before we go? Uh, no, I, uh, I just love hanging out here with all of you, talking about the things we love. And mm. uh, I uh, look forward to doing this again for uh, the Savage Curtain. Which the is Savage Curtain, yes. Yeah, which okay, is a so guilty when, pleasure episode. It's in my when, top um, ten. But. <laughs> well, Gene Roddenberry had a, a say in that, so yeah. that's going to be interesting. That's going to be. I got to do some extra work for that one, but thank you for getting me pretty amped for that. Yeah, Yarnick. Yarnick with his time. clicking claws. 
Love it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And yeah. pop culture curator, could you tell us what's your journey around here on the internet, so we can we can know how to find yeah, it? Thank you for having me on. Yeah, thank you for having me on tonight. We're doing a horror sci-fi theater at six p.m. Mountain Time. We are doing the classic Return of the Living Dead, and I did fix the link. For those, I know we discussed it last night on my stream. The link wasn't working, but I did fix it. Please try to watch it tonight before the stream. Tomorrow night, Gorillas, Random Thoughts, and myself will be back with two more episodes of Season 3 of Gilligan's Island. Saturday at seven, Saturday, 6 p.m. Mountain. I'll be back with another Bumbling from the Lab. And next Monday, another episode from the classic Lost in Space at 6 p.m. Mountain. And thank you again. And thank you. And hello. And thank you, everybody in the chat, all my good friends out there for being here. I had a great time today. And I was so happy I was able to make it. So thank you. Me too. Oh, hold on. I got a chat in the way. I got a Move this over here. Hey, hey, Jim, what's going on with you? And Commodore Productions, still hard to work on fan films. I got one almost ready, just waiting on a couple actors to send me their stuff. Should be launching April 8th. The same April day. 8th. Wow. April 8th. Send, uh, be the same day when the moon covers up the, the sun. Ooh, yeah. yep. I got my glasses ready. Me too. I got, I got ten of them. Special. Ten of them. I got five. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, there you go. Everybody, be safe. Do not stare directly into the sun without Ooh. permission. You will on? go blind. Okay. Thank okay. you. Yes. And Birdo Prey Five, are you there? I know your avatar says away, but I guess you really are away. And so, since you are away, I will plug your channel for you. Please subscribe to Bird of Prey 5. I got his channel link right here. This is an incredible channel. He makes some short form video content uh, reviewing Star Trek and talking about very important things related to Star Trek. But he also has live streams. And specifically, he has Bed Life on Mondays and Fridays. And. Maybe someday he'll bring back the watch parties I used to have for Wednesday, but I don't know about that just yet. But other than that, he also has some random streams. You never know when he's going to stream. So just keep an eye on his channel. He's a great storyteller. He's funny. He's interesting to listen to. When, when he's on a panel, you don't really hear as much from him. So that's why I like when he streams by himself. And so we get to hear just him, and it is spectacular. So thank you. Thank you, Bird, for being here. Yeah, you know, yeah. He also just celebrated five thousand subs, so good for him. Yes, congratulations yeah. to wow, Bird five thousand. That's excellent. I wish I had that. <laughs> um, he deserves it. Yes, he does. That's sweet. I good like man, Bird. Kapla. Yeah. And Kapla. And, yeah. and Donnie says, "Thank you, Jill, and all. Till next we meet. May you and yours live long and prosper. Thank you so Very much, Jill. Indeed." Well, I don't guys. have time to read everybody's name because I got to dash out of here. But Keithy says, yes, thank you for the membership. It was just too kind. Yes, congratulations, Keith, for that. Don't read any of uh, Franco's comments. So <laughs> Wait a minute. Why not? What happened to Franco's comments? Uh, I would say that about James Caserta. <laughs> don't forget to leave a comment. As you leave, it helps the channel grow. James Caserta yes, is oh, he's all right. Calvin L. Weir says, take care, Jill. Thank you so much, Calvin. Good to see you. I think I've seen you once before. You're relatively new. I'm a spanner. Bow before me, says Frinkle. Oh. <laughs> He's a wrench, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he, well, he is. He is a wrench. <laughs> I lower myself before the Frinkle. <laughs> Don't delete. Oh, those... Those funny Wait, who's, chatters, who's, I tell who's you. getting deleted? I deleted? don't know. I, how quickly the chat can turn and stab you. Back. Wait a minute. What happened oh. in the chat that I missed? Oh, that, I think they're they're being snarky to Franco. <laughs> oh, okay. Talking about not okay. leading his chats. It's like, no, we got to read Franco's chats. They're... Yeah. 
Okay, yeah. I won't delete you. Oh, <laughs> yeah. you're okay. You're okay. Don't, don't delete me. Uh, Harquin Thirty says, "Hey, Franco, this is the only channel we are on where you're a wrench, and I'm not. Don't ban me, bro. <laughs> <laughs> don't That's ban okay. me, bro. Okay, guys. Next week, of course, like Stone Record said, we're going to cover the Savage Curtain. So I will play the preview. Abraham for Lincoln for the win. No. <laughs> mm -hmm. Abraham Lincoln. Oh, one of in outer space. Her. What? Bye -bye, uh, this everybody. is a, an Ahura scene Bye, that Pop. I quote. Bye, Pop. Take time. care. Take care now. And of, of course, we don't want to spoil that, so let's save that for next week. And uh, and goodbye, everybody. Goodbye, Joe. Have, have a lovely Tuesday. Thanks. Again. Bye, everybody. Take care. You too. Captain Kirk, I believe. Alert status. Do I gather that you recognize me? I am Abraham Lincoln, just as I am whom I appear to be, Seraph. Greatest of all who ever lived on our planet, Captain. Some of these you may know from history. Colonel Green, who led a genocidal war. Zora, Genghis Khan, Kalis. Zora, no need to blame yourself. We have a complete power failure. What happened? The shielding is breaking down, and I estimate four hours before the ship blows up. To, to save, save your, your ship and, and your crew, crew you have, have to win. Oh! Captain, how can we warn him? our differences combine to create meaning and beauty. It has always been easier to destroy than to create. Well, now you have something new to think about. Carry on. All right, move along. Done. Stop it. Get off of the f things. Go outside. Get some food. It's like, you know, there's, it's a time of day where you live. Go do something. <laughs> Shut up, Snoopy. I don't care. You smoke too much. Let's go. Let's go adventure. Let's go explore. See you around the galaxy.